welcome to the regular town council meeting, town of Cape Creek, Arizona, Monday, May 6, 2019. Executive session will be held at six. Um, call to order, please. Want to roll call, please? Council member Susan Clancy. Here. Paul Diefenderfer. Here. Thomas McGuire. He's Ro on his way. Robert Morris. Here. Catherine Royer. Here. Vice Mayor David Smith. Here. Mayor Ernie Bunch. Here. Uh, looks like we're almost all here. Okay. An executive session will be held during the regular uh, uh, council session for legal matters pursuant to Arizona Revised Statute Section 38-431.03, print 3. Discussion, consultation, direction, legal advice with the town attorney regarding town review and decision regarding the proposed incorporation of New River Desert Hills. Um, can we, what do we do when Tom shows up late if we're in, we're in a session? Do we lock him out? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have a motion to move into executive session? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes clearly have it. 2019 and Rodeo. Mr. Silver, would you lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. <laughs> Public announcements. Uh, I think we're going to just cover everything a little bit later on in here, so I'm good to go. Um, call the public. Boy, well, you weren't ready for that, were you? <laughs> Yolande Grill. It's up at the podium. Jane, uh, it's up at the podium. Oh, yes. yeah, it's easier. Um, <laughs> make yourself comfortable. <laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> Here we go. I timed myself. Three minutes. <laughs> Very good. Hi there. Okay, there's no such thing as a safe poison, and that's why I'm here tonight, so thank you for hearing me. Benjamin Franklin is quoted as saying that there are three kinds of people in the world, those that are immovable, those that are movable, and those that move. So those who are immovable are people who don't get it. They're never going to get it. They're not interested in getting it, and they're not going to do anything about it. The people who are movable are people who see the need for change, and they're open and prepared to listen to ideas. I love Cave Creek. I love the wildlife that we're privileged to share the space with here. And I believe that there's more people in Cave Creek that actually care about the wild than there are people who don't. I also believe that in the group of people that act like they don't care, ones that seem immovable, that even in that group there are people who, given the right information, may actually be willing to listen. And by being educated about the subject, specifically the deadly effects of rodenticides for pest control, people will be inspired to care. Um, and I believe that our hearts are big enough that we can actually hold space for the people who, even after they get the information, still don't want to change their ways. So I'm here to ask for help from you, the town council. I would love it if the town could help me spread educational material about caring for our wildlife, the wildlife that makes this town simply magical. I'm asking for the town to help me distribute pamphlets or flyers in the water bill. And the purpose of the flyer is to help educate the people about the deadly consequences of these poisons. Um, if the town doesn't have a budget, my husband and I are willing to figure out how to pay for it or raise funds to pay for it, but the cost doesn't have to be, um, you know, borne by the town. We've lived here since 93. Two of our children were born here. Um, we are now grandparents, and so this is informed by that lens. I'm a grandmother, and I really hope for the future. Um, through another lens, I photographed the wildlife that's here, and within two days, I saw a dead rat at the top of my driveway that had bled out on the pavement, and within 
less than 12 hours or 24 hours from that, someone posted on Facebook a picture of an owl that also bled in her own arms. And this is as a result of eating the mice. And of course, this killed me because 12 years ago, I lost a dog and a cat in my own yard because my neighbors put out poison in their yard. And I'm not judging anyone because I was one of those people that used to put out poison a very long time ago. But once I moved to Cave Creek, my neighbors helped me and they showed me that there are other ways to do it, how to use life traps or kill traps. And um, I just wanna help other people the way people help me um, by educating them. So that's my ask. Thank you very much. We're not really allowed to respond to you, but Mr. Sims, <clears throat> years ago, we passed an ordinance that made, made the retailers put Sudafed and those type things somewhere else in, the, in their establishments. Could we do that with, with rabinicides? Tonight, you could take action to ask staff to put that on our agenda and look at it. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Katja Kinsel. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Katja Kinsel, 41200 North Echo Canyon Drive, Cave Creek. Um, I was out of the country for two weeks, and as I always do, I like to catch up on things, and was reading minutes. Um, I don't know what's happened to the minutes, but it's almost like no information. Um, and I'll give you examples. Uh, on uh, four one, I spoke, and here's what it says that I said. I spoke about portable signs, pedestrian signs, the town code, enforcement, visual distractions, <coughs> clutter, and confusion. Doesn't say what I said. We come up here to put things on paper to go and make public our feelings. So that's a nondescript, right? I know you can't answer. So then in reading the minutes, and this is absolutely no criticism of, of Jane. I don't know how these minutes are put together, but it's like a giant run-on sentence. And if you're scanning, looking for the motion for the agenda item, you can't find it. It just looks the same. Um, so moving on to 4.15 minutes, a call to public uh, uh, concerning the signed ordinance. Lisa Baker stands up and talks about, she's a business owner um, and had recent notices to businesses on signed violation. What were those? I'm sure she said what it was. It's not here. As a citizen, I'm trying to read what people are saying and it's not here. Dave Flat, blah, blah, blah. He spoke about by bike week or, or, or odors and maintenance. What did he say? I have no idea. Oh, and then, this to me is extremely important. Carrie spoke about the radar signs installed. And then she introduced the new utility director, Mr. Sean, I'm sorry I can't pronounce his name right, Cruz Weisner, <coughs> giving his background and then he spoke briefly. What did he say? It's not here. I just find that unconscionable. Then, after uh, Madison Eden gave a presentation, three minutes, Vice Mayor Smith asked Carrie, Carrie Dyrek about addressing the issues with dumping excess water in Rancho Mignana Ponds. Ms. Dyrek is hoping that Rancho Mignano, Mignano will work with the town on solutions for evaporation and seepage. 
That was no answer to the question. Three minutes. I, I am done. I hope you, oh, no, sorry, one more thing. Certification says, I hereby certify that the foregoing minutes are a true and correct copy of the minutes of the regular session of the town council. So um, please, I am done. Please correct the situation and have the minutes verbatim. So people who don't attend Three minutes. can understand. Please Thank you, down. Mr. Bunch. We got a long agenda tonight. Usually I let people go on a little bit longer, but uh, we got a lot of stuff going on. That's all, okay. Uh, town manager. Mayor, members of council, uh, staff has been working over the past couple of weeks on information, putting, uh, gathering and putting information together regarding fire prevention um, activities that we can put out to the public to assist them with uh, preparing their uh, property and, and protecting themselves and protecting the community. So uh, we have uh, Marshall Stein, who's going to uh, give an overview of materials that uh, are put together from his perspective and then and the criteria behind them and where the information came from. And then uh, Luke Houtzman is going to speak after him. These are just short, brief. <laughs> she knows I'm from New York, it's not even fair. <laughs> Overview, the information will be on uh, the town's website, put out on the Facebook for public information, but if you would like to have a further detailed discussion, we'll agendize it uh, for a future council uh, meeting. Mayor, council, I appreciate the time to talk to you. So, Carrie told me I have to keep it under three minutes. It's gonna be very quick. Um, <laughs> we have a bunch of pamphlets available. Obviously, this year we're really concerned about fire. Um, fire restrictions are going in effect already at the county parks as of May 1st. Um, just extreme conditions as far as uh, uh, very dry and outlook for water uh, is not looking very good for us. Uh, again, all those pamphlets are available at Town Hall. Anyone who wants to pick them up, by all means. I did bring some pamphlets over here on the side as well for readiness and uh, preparedness. Uh, obviously with the Cave Creek Complex fire, um, we really don't want to repeat that if we could avoid it. Um, one of the things we could do today to help for tomorrow is clearing the defensible area around your homes, uh, remove all the dead brush and weeds, uh, get rid of the ladder f uh, fuels. Um, if you have trees that are hanging down to the ground, try and trim them, keep them up so that if God forbid there is a fire underneath, it won't spread to your tree and won't go further. Uh, if you have trees that are touching, obviously you want to separate those trees as well best you can. You want to try and eliminate those uh, ladder fuels best you can. Um, <coughs> We're going to have neighbors, you know, Cave Creek, one of the great things that people always say about Cave Creek is that we're just a, a great small town in the community. Uh, there are going to be neighbors that we all have that don't have the ability to, to move the stuff away from their house, don't, don't have the ability to trim their weeds, don't have the ability to, to make these fire breaks. Um, so let's look out for our neighbors, try and help them out best we can. And I, I wrote down some of the um, <coughs> zones. They recommend defensible areas around our homes. Zone one is 30 feet from your home. Zone two is 100 feet from your home. Um, and then it gives you ideas of what you can remove. Uh, a lot of us have fireplaces. We have wood stacks very close to our home. I'm lazy. I don't want to have to walk too far to get my firewood for my uh, fire pit. So I actually keep it really close to my house. I've since moved it away. Um, again, they recommend you move it outside of your 100 foot zone. Um, anything that's really combustible is what you're going to want to move outside of your uh, zones. Zone two is the 100 foot mark. <clears throat> Again, um, those of you that have acreage, um, just try and clear your land as best you can um, without going overboard. Keep just taking out what's dead and getting rid of it and uh, trying to avoid any problems. Um, if by any means you see a fire, just call it in. Um, we're not in a big city. It's not typical to see smoke. Um, in our town uh, for extended periods of time. So if you see it, just call it in. I'd rather we check it out and make sure we're not having any big problems. Um, as of today, we've had uh, four brush fires, five, pardon, five brush fires, including one on Friday. Um, it's just really, really dry out there, so please do what you can to just try and be careful. A uh, big thing that they're saying is welding and uh, tow chains. Those of you that tow trailers and tow, um, 
uh, boots, make sure your chains aren't dragging on the ground, causing sparks and uh, giving us problems. And last but not least is Code Red. Uh, the town was the first town in the uh, municipality in Arizona to sign up for the Code Red system. Um, all you have to do is go onto their website, you go onto the town's website and click the link to it. And uh, that's how we notify you in the event of an emergency. Uh, any mass um, message we want to get out to the residents goes through our Code Red system. Oh. There's also a fantastic application that they have through Code Red, which is the weather alerts as we get to monsoon season. Um, very, very accurate. It tells you um, your, you could set your perimeter. Uh, mine, for example, is a five mile perimeter and any significant weather in that five mile perimeter goes off and uh, yeah, I, I stuck to my time. Marshall Stein, may I ask you a question? You may ask anything you like, I'm sorry. How, uh, what is the penetration of the, of the Code Red? We, what, how many uh, residents do we have signed up for that? Uh, one of the great things about Code Red, one of the reasons why the council uh, wanted to go with it, um, we have all the underlying data to begin with. So um, what Code Red does is anyone that has a phone, anyone that has um, cellular phones that are on record in this jurisdiction in this area, um, they already have the underlying data. Then we have the residents go on and, and self-populate as well, which is what we highly encourage. Um, this way we have you more accurate information. So when we launch a campaign, and uh, thank God we haven't had to launch Code Red for a emergency. Uh, what we've launched so far are um, uh, utility alerts more than anything else. If we have a mass uh, water main break, we use it for that. So we don't call it a code red, we call it a utility <laughs> alert. Um, code red we're saving just for emergencies, and uh, like I said, we put it in place 2005, uh, right after the Cape Creek complex fire. The county has a reverse 911 system, but as a small town, uh, I think it's in our best interest to have our own system to be able to know that it's not going to be an overtax system that another municipality, perhaps a larger municipality is in the process of using and we have to wait a little bit. So that's why we have the code red. Um, so we have a, a good amount of people that have signed up for it. Uh, but like I said, even if they haven't signed up for it, we have the underlying data on, on a lot of them. Uh, the difference would be like if we have snowbirds that haven't populated their New York telephone to here, those are the people in particular you want to make sure we're in. Councilman McGuire, you have a question? This doesn't count for my three minutes, by the way, because they're asking me questions. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're using it for Tom's now. <laughs> we're getting uh, a little farther from the <laughs> discussion on it. We can't. Well, that was presentation. We can't talk about it. Was this was count, um, it's under the manager's report. This is just information only. Okay. We can agendize it for a future meeting. Okay, um, we can do that. Then. Part two of this is that, yes, we um, Department of Emergency Management has these criteria out there. You want to clear away from your um, structures, but we also are consciously, uh, in, in Cave Creek, we're conscious with a native habitat corridor. We don't want people going out and blading their properties, so Luke will kind of go over the things that are invasive and the things that are native. Okay. So here's here's three sides, the good, bad, and the ugly. I got my information on there. If anyone wants to call and talk about weeds and other things, uh, email, call me, I'm available. Uh, so the good are the native shrubs that we see commonly occurring around the town. You've got bursage, which is our most predominant ground cover. A lot of people call it gross looking uh, like a weed, but it's actually very, uh, intricate to the ecosystem here. We have brittle bush, creosote, and also jojoba. Uh, the nice thing about native ground cover is they're not uh, relying on water, supplemental water, and they also limit the ability for invasive weeds to propagate. So um, generally with weeds, as we'll get into the bad now, these are invasive species of weeds. The most commonly occurring that, that we've seen the last several years are the multistar thistle. It's a long, kind of spindly, um, plant with a purple flower. You got the fiddle neck, which is a long green. Uh, the top of it looks like a like the neck of a fiddle. Um, and then the obviously the desert broom. And these weeds will come in anywhere you've disturbed and haven't really used. So a lot of times we'll see them in arenas if, if someone's moved out and the arena hasn't been used and turned over that dirt. Uh, those type of, type of weeds will come in and, and take root. So here's the ugly, and what we've seen this year is the uh, Chinese globe chamomile. Uh, it's a weed that, as far as I know, wasn't even in the state of Arizona more than a decade ago. And if you've driven around town lately, you see it everywhere. And this kind of breaks the rules with invasive weeds in that it's fine and dandy just growing anywhere, whether it's undisturbed natural desert, you can see it on hillsides, uh, and also on shoulders of roads. So. 
it really is uh, something that we're going to have to get a handle on. Um, the the manual removal, so pulling it out or using a hula ho is the best way to do it. Uh, try to get at it before the warmer weather, the 90 degree plus days. Uh, that's when it goes to brown and all the seeds oh. have been cast, so there's really nothing you can do until the next time they start growing. Um, another thing that I'm gonna try personally is applying a pre-emergent during the winter months before while we're getting our rains, so to kind of see if it has any effect on um, the next spring when they come in. So they're, they're definitely a fire hazard. If you've driven around and seen, they're just like a bunch of little matchsticks waiting to, waiting to go off. So definitely clear, like Marshall Stein said, clear a safe area around, around your property. Um, try to leave the native stuff in where you can, but if you just have large growths of the chamomile, then just better off taking it, taking it all out. So that's... All I have. Okay. And the last part is the uh, public works crew have been out actively mowing the public rights of way on the main uh, thoroughfares. So they've gotten through uh, Cave Creek Road and along Carefree Highway. Uh, they plan to do Schoolhouse Road. I, I, I don't know the exact schedule. School, Spur Cross, Schoolhouse, um, 32nd Street, Highland, and I said Cave Creek and, and Carefree Highway. If there are other areas that um, it, people have concerns about that are public rights of way, they can call in to uh, town hall and we'll have the public works crew go take a, a look at those areas if there's growth right up to the road that they could uh, mow around. So we're trying to actively um, cut back. People tend to still throw their cigarettes out the window and and uh, like the marshal said, the, the chains sparking along the highway or roadways. So, and that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moves us on to uh, Action items, consent agenda, approval April 1st, 2019, regular town council meeting minutes, approval April 15th, 2019, regular town council meeting minutes. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Motion. A second. All those in favor, sitting by this, uh, saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes clearly have it. Um, moving on to general agenda, item number one, presentation to council by uh, Terry. Luke, why are you sitting there? By Carrie Porter uh, Brace, Executive Director of the Cave Creek Museum on the activities of the museum, followed by discussion and possible action by Council to approve a community grant to the museum. Mayor, members of, of Council, if I could just start um, saying that in this fiscal year budget, there are funds um, in the Town Council budget for the museum that would require your approval, but we've requested that Carrie come and, and give a presentation so you know what, what they've been up to and how they would uh, anticipate using the funds. So that way you have a report prior to an action uh, requesting that you approve the $10,000. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for taking uh, my presentation, and I hope you enjoy what I have to say about it and uh, some of the information that I'm going to present. The Cave Creek Museum has recently enhanced its mission. The board voted and approved this at the last meeting as the preservation and interpretation of the natural resources and cultural heritage of the northern Sonoran Desert. This puts us at a little bigger than just the Cave Creek Mining District or the De Desert Foothills, so that includes the land that goes all the way into the hinterlands. You know, we, we as residents, or you as residents, um, know that the area that's defined by the Desert Foothills kind of touches on a lot of areas, and our collections reflect a broader uh, scope than just what appears in uh, 144 square miles as defined by the uh, Cape Creek Mining District. So in the year 2020, we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary. As I just mentioned, we preserve the region's cultural heritage. We promote better understanding and good stewardship of the region's natural resources. And we sponsor education programs that appeal to broad audiences, addressing important <coughs> local issues. Not too long ago, we had uh, Sarah Porter come up from the Kyle Institute. The Kyle Institute studies water usage. Uh, they are ASU's Morrison Institute's uh, policy 
a division on water, uh, history of water, the use of water in the state of Arizona. Ironically, the night she presented, we had a really big rainstorm. <laughs> So, all right, we preserve our shared cultural heritage, as you might recognize. Uh, this wonderful thing you see in front of you is the Golden Reef 10 Stamp Mill. And on its side there now, we have added our historic tramway. All this came off of Continental Mountain over the last 10 years and was reassembled by our amazing, wonderful dream team. The Desmount Sanatorium's tuberculosis cabin, uh, some of you may or may not know that the TB cabins were scattered around uh, the area that's currently occupied by Harold's and the Horny Toad. There are about 20 to 30 cabins that were used in the desert as uh, tuberculosis sanatorium camp. Uh, all but one are gone or have been incorporated in other architecture in town. So the last standing tuberculosis cabin in the state of Arizona is curated by the Cape Creek Museum and it is under the National Register of Historic Places. The historic church and gazebo, uh, you may recognize this cute little chapel. It was the first church to be built in Cave Creek. Cave Creek, I think, started about 1871. And the church was built in 1946. So um, do the math on that. <laughs> but yes, it was the first church built by the Assembly of God and then used as a missionary church by the Episcopals. And uh, in the next season, we're going to celebrate Lester Maitland. He was a notable Episcopal priest who had previously been the Brigadier General from the Army Air Force in World War I and World War II. Okay, the gazebo used to stand at the center of Cave Creek and we use that now for events and weddings. Uh, if you don't recognize the church in this picture, that building was the historic church rehabbed into our first museum building. Um, if any of you have visited our facility, you may not believe how much you could pack into a small place and uh, that I think there was an extension on the back of that. Uh, so it was maybe a little longer than the original church structure, but not much. And now we have two wings probably that size on each side of our auditorium. We provide valuable services to residents and vis residents, visitors alike. We convey our unique hometown stories and social values. That uh, lady mannequin there is wearing Dorothy Smith's gown. Dorothy Smith started the Desert Foothills Library, and the mannequin is actually from Goldwaters. So that's a historic mannequin as well. And the photo you see in the bottom corner are a group of youngsters learning about desert wildlife safety. They're being introduced to friendly and not so friendly lizards and snakes in that picture, learning how to behave safely around them. We educate lifelong learners of the historic, ecological, and archaeological wonders of the northern Sonoran Desert. We provide local volunteer opportunities which benefit individual well-being and institutional strength. The Cave Creek Museum fiscal year 2018-19 annual report recorded 8,300 153 volunteer hours donated by over 60 people with a value of over $25 an hour that comes to over $217,000 worth of volunteer time given to the museum. Our budget's probably a little more than half of that, but you can tell we put a lot of good time in. And I want to thank several members of the town council who've been our volunteers in the past. We welcome over 10,000 domestic and international visitors annually. And uh, since 2016, we've increased attendance at least 15, if not 16% over the last two years. We participate in Act One's Culture Pass Partnership, which enables somebody to go to Maricopa County Library, check out a Culture Pass, and visit us for free. Oh, this year, we've hosted 500 guests on the Culture Pass, and that enables them to spend their money not on admission, but maybe on things in the gift store, or buying lunch, or visiting town. So, next one. 
this is from my experience as a peer reviewer from the American Alliance of Museums. I travel nationwide annually doing peer reviews for small institutions, and it's been a lot of fun. This information comes from our head office in Alexandria, Virginia. Museums support 7,000 726,000 jobs in the United States and directly employ 372,100 people, more than double that of the professional sports industry, and contribute probably $50 billion to the U.S. economy each year, twice of the previous estimates. The recent Oxford Mellon study determined that for every $100 of economic activity created by museums, an additional $220 are generated in other sectors of the United States economy as a result of supply chain and employee expenditure impacts. The Arizona museums themselves contributed $936 million in a financial impact on the state's economy alone. So you know that while we are a small nonprofit, museums as a, a field or discipline or in general make significant contributions not just to our arts and culture but to our economy as well. Our educational arts programs, uh, we offer programs that, uh, with a wide appeal to all people. This year we've switched up our family fun days to second Sundays at CCM and we also have an adult continuing education series called Cape Creek Museum Presents. The topics range from historical events to desert wildlife safety, pioneer experiences, Arizona archaeology, mining history, and Native American rock art. As I mentioned previously, in this spring, we've hosted Sarah Porter from the Kyle Center for Water Policy at ASU's Morrison Institute to present on water issues. And then we also invited Native American artist Orlin Joe to present at the Desert Foothills Library. So that was, both of those in, uh, events were well attended. We were very pleased. Some of our objectives for 2019-2020 for programs. This summer we are offering what's called the Steampunk Science Summer Camp. This will be in the second week of July. And what that celebrates and explores are the 19th century scientific advancements that brought Arizona into the contemporary age. In the fall, we're going to open with our new exhibit, the Gary Jones Retrospective. Gary Jones laid out the town of Carefree and built the first 170 homes in uh, the Boulders area. Altogether, he's built 327 homes, with his most recent one opening this last week. It's for sale at Hawk's Nest right now, if you're interested. Uh, we'll be working on collections management projects with the University of Arizona, ASU, and Northern Arizona University students. So, museums and public opinion, this might be of some interest to you folks. 97% of the public surveyed believe that museums provide valuable an education experience to their communities. 89% recognize the important economic contributions and jobs that museum bring. And 96% would approve of elected officials who act to support museums, including acting to maintain or increase federal funding. So, thank you so much for your generous support in the past. I hope I've given you a, a reasonable overview of the kinds of things we do and would love to continue doing for our community. Is there any? Anyone who has a question? Do we have any questions from council? I have questions. Yeah, yeah Councilman, Councilman Roy. Who comprises your board of directors? Uh, right now we have Bill Ullman of Carefree, who is our board president. Let's see, who else is there? Suzanne Johnson, longtime resident. Uh, she's uh, married to Michael Johnson, the Taliesa West uh, architect. She's written books and uh, produced videos on the town of Cave Creek. Let's see, uh, Mark Pegler of Frontier Town. Um, let's see, I'm sorry, I don't have the list in front of me. Um, it's a big group. There's seven it's of them. It's a big group. So, there's seven yeah. total. Yeah, and we've had a nomination from the general uh, membership that will be uh, voted on at our next meeting. Reg Monachino thrown his hat in for vice president. So. And when did you arrive? Two years ago. Well, on behalf of the council, if we haven't said it already, you might have before I came. Welcome to Cave Creek. I think you're doing a fabulous job. And um, we applaud your efforts. 
Thank to you very improve much. Improve our community. I don't know if you've heard me say this, but I come from a very similar town, a pair of towns in Il northern Illinois, Roscoe and Rockton, Illinois, which without the mountains and the cactus could very well be Cave Creek and Carefree. <laughs> so I feel very much at home here. But um, I tell you, it also feels a lot like home. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Any other questions? No, all right. We have public comment on this. Okay. Do we have any? Oh, we're back to council. Do we have a dream team member that would like to make a motion? Sure, I'll make the motion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have a question. The museum is getting oh, the office uh -oh. space every Tuesday. Did you, who do you have a question for? I just, well, I just have a, a question to staff. Um, it shows that we have um, $20,000 budgeted. Uh, what other community grants uh, are there maybe pending as well? Do we, or is it first come, first serve? <laughs> and I know we've given this every year, but it's Mayor, uh, council member, I, I don't recall off the top of, the, of my head, I know 10,000 was designated um, for, in the budget for the um, Cave Creek Museum. Right. Um, I'm not sure what the other funds are just off the top of my, my head, but. Well, I remember last yeah. year it was um, Christmas something, and oh, yeah. we well, had another $10,000. We, we paid for that no, all, out of other special events. Okay, so and, the, the 20,000 will just remain as Right, and we also, paid for a parade out of special events where we sponsored it, so that may tie into the additional yeah. funds, so. Okay. Dream Teamer, please make a motion. Motion to approve a community grant to the Cave Creek Museum for an amount of $10,000. Second. Second. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> you had the motion, would you like to make comments? It's been, a, I've been volunteering for the museum for, I don't know, about a decade, and. It's been a fun project, and if you haven't seen the stamp mill run, you got to come by and see that. The next run, I think, is May 11th. I'm collecting ore still that I want to bring you, let you run through there for me. We haven't gotten any gold at all, really. <laughs> well, there may be some in this. I had to roast it, though. Mm -hmm. um, all right, this is uh, financial. Can we have a roll, please? Uh, I'm yes. oh, sorry, Tom. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd like to point out that the museum does play a vital role for the town in terms of keeping the records for the town. I think that they are rather unique in terms of service directly to the town and doing things that otherwise would probably fall upon our staff. May I make one more comment? Just real quick, because it concerns the future, especially in regard to the art, the records you're talking about. One of the projects I would like to see in the next five years is an expansion of the facility, but in a way that benefits the entire community. And I wanted to talk to the library, because I know we have become the archival repository for a lot of uh, records, historical papers, images, etc. We have a digitization project that's ongoing, but we are running out of space. And I know uh, this board and perhaps our future boards will be considering an effort to expand the facility in such a way that we can become the archival and the archeological repository for these communities. Mm -hmm. that Interesting. Uh, any other comments from council? I, I have one. Um, my husband served 15 years on the board of directors. Uh, a couple of years ago, he stepped off. But my nephew also, for his Eagle Scout, uh, raised money to put in for the stamp mill that board that everybody sees when they go through it. So I have a, an affection very much for the museum. Glad you're there. And I'll throw one out there too. My mother sure. was a history teacher, so I love the museum. <laughs> um, as a young child in Denton, Texas, I rode my bicycle to the North Texas State University Museum all the time to look at the look at the exhibits. It is financial. Council Member Morris. Yes. Council Member McGuire. Yes. Vice Mayor Smith. Yes. Council Member Diefenderfer. Yes. Council Member Clancy. Yes. Council Member Royer. Yes. Mayor Bunch. Yes, by seven nothing. Motion carries. Uh, congratulations. Uh, moving on, agenda item number two, presentation to Council on the Cave Creek Rodeo Days event and ticket sales. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, if I could just give a quick overview. Um, 
Uh, recently, the council entered into an agreement between the town and the Cape Creek uh, Rodeo Committee, and uh, one of the items in the agreement is that they would come uh, follow up with the council publicly to present on the success of the uh, rodeo. So we have the committee um, members are here to present, and one of them happens to be our own <coughs> Luke Kelsman. Thank you, Town Manager, uh, Mayor, members of Council. The 2018 Cape Creek Rodeo Days was a very successful community event. It began with a well-attended parade and mutton busting on March 16th. Then we had a golf tournament during the week, and that culminated with the PRCA sanctioned rodeo March 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Uh, the dates for next year's events to put in your calendar uh, look to be March 27th, 28th, and 29th with the parade the week prior, so that would be Saturday the 21st. As uh, the town manager stated, this is per the lease agreement between the town and Cape Creek Rodeo Days, and there are members of the board of directors here to present specifics about the growth of the event, including ticket sales and funds that the organization was able to donate to other area nonprofit organizations. The board consists of President Beth Cornell, Danny Piaquadio, Darren Peterson, Lynette Gwynn, Dan Sabin, Ernie Bunch, and myself. And I'll turn that over to uh, President Beth Cornell. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, tagging in on what he's talking about, we did receive considerable assistance from various charities this year, and we have made uh, donations in the amount of 15,000 to some of whom have received. Outdoor Experience for All was our Patriot donation this year. The YMCA is receiving money from us, Bella Vista, School, Bella Vista Academy. Um, the Foothills Wranglers 4-H program, those were the four organizations that really brought a minimum of around 14 people to help us out at the event this year. So we were very thankful for those people. Um, Foothills Food Bank is a recipient also. Uh, we will be giving to a local equine charity called Saving Grace of Arizona. Um, cryolysis, I know I, I never say this right, Christ, Chrysalis. Chrysalis? <laughs> okay. uh, d it's a domestic violence center that we donate our Saturday night um, $1 per ticket sale to to help against teen dating violence and domestic violence. Um, we also have a few checks tonight, one for the museum for $1,000, and we have one for the 500, or the 100 club for the chief that's here, if you can accept that tonight. I would be happy to give that out to you guys. Um, but that being said, we did have our ticket sales of 5321, and we have a check to present to the town of $15,963 per the agreement. Wow. So. We're happy to give that back. And would you like me to give it to Perry or is Robert in the room? <laughs> He's hiding. Who, who, wants the check? who wants the check tonight? I'll <laughs> take it. Yeah, I want to follow up on some other stuff. It was just, uh, I don't know if everybody's in attendance. I saw most of you guys there. Uh, the beautiful thing about this rodeo and why I got involved earlier, because it's part of the town, and there was a good representation from the council members, obviously the community. Um, it was exciting to see some of the numbers we were able to pull off after this, uh, this being our third year from almost not having a rodeo at all. And truly all the volunteers and the board and um, the countless hours will put in should all be commended. Uh, ticket sales increased over over $37,000 from 2018. Our bar sales, beverage sales, <laughs> increased over 10,000 uh, from 2018. Um, sponsorship do dollars were down a little bit, but that was a significant uh, contribution from Kiwanis, which they are considering uh, re-upping next year. Uh, merchandise was up, um, the event person, Participation was just greatly received. I have never seen uh, a Sunday that full, and, and I've been part of that rodeo for over 20 years for both organizations. Uh, what the town has done and provided for support, um, Mike, and the members of the crew uh, beyond exceptional this year. Uh, the cohesive relationship, although not everything's perfect, seemed to go very well played as like a small town should. So we want to thank you as a board for um, continued support and providing some of those tools for us, for us to help to succeed. We hope uh, the town recognizes uh, a successful job and we're incorporating our culture, our heritage, and uh, continuation of a great event. And we want to thank you and everybody involved. So well done. Thank you.
Any council members have any questions or? Oh, there's public comment on this as well. We have nothing. Wow, that's cool. Appreciate, uh, enjoy working with y'all, by the way, all of you. And uh, I believe we bring bring something important to the town. Great job. Councilman McGuire. And I think it also helps to define Cave Creek. We consider ourselves in many ways a western town and what could be more western than a rodeo. I agree. I, without it, we wouldn't be, it's not the west, most western town, but I think it is Maybe now, it is. so. <laughs> <laughs> to, again, Scott's still there may be a trademark on that. Yeah. I, yeah. I think I remember hearing about it. I, I, I think they did, the uh, people that have that did not show up at the Gunslinger. <laughs> <laughs> remember there was a shootout, yeah. and they were no-shows. Yeah. This was oh, regard to the, the name West Most West. Oh, that's right. They that's were, right. They were absent to define. Yeah. yeah. Their, their no, no it's, 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 it's part of who we are, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to serve the community and, and uh, keep it going. I think you have amazing volunteers. Yeah. Without volunteers, we couldn't do it. I mean, including yourselves, who work so hard. I saw you on Sunday, and... And I think you were just about done, but uh, you know, you did a fabulous job, and it, it couldn't have been done without you. Don't turn. We appreciate you guys, and we look forward to next year. Starting already. Bob knows. All right. So, come, okay, we're going to move on to uh, agenda item number three. Uh, a council member will discuss a possible unintended open meeting law violation resulting from the use of a reply to all response in an email that was then distributed to all council members uh, placed on the agenda by the uh, town attorney. Mr. Mayor, members of council, as you know, you're subject to the open meeting law. The state statutes uh, the, the require all of your legal action when a quorum of you meet to take legal action to be done in public so that your constituents know what occurs. The statutes, however, define a meeting quite broadly to include not only legal action, but simply proposing action. And if I could quote a sentence from the AG manual, when members of the public body are parties to an exchange of an email communication that involve discussions uh, uh, by a quorum concerning a matter that may come before the public body, the communications constitute a violation. This may be true even if none of the members of the public body respond to. Councilmember Defender uh, went to, the, went to uh, the, man, the manager and said, there was an email that was communicated to all of you by a constituent about the fire, your fire ordinance, fire, uh, fireworks ordinance. And uh, he responded simply by saying to all of you by accident, I'd like the council to revisit the fireworks ordinance so we can discuss modifying it. That technically is a violation. He and I chatted about it. The law is clear that had four of you conspired to take action, the law tells me what to do. We ratify it in public. Well, there ain't anything to ratify. And so what I said to Paul is, let's just disclose this. It was a completely unintended action so that your constituents and more likely the AG can see that we know what the open meeting law means. So simply, I think I've reported what happened. I think the minutes would record that correctly. Correct, sir? Yep. All right. Thank you. And I've since removed the reply all but. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a good action. Um, having done that, looks like we're ready to move on to the next one. Um, Carrie, Carrie. We have gentlemen sitting behind you. You think we ought to move that up, or? Yeah. <laughs> You're happy sitting there? No. Okay. We can go. I'll be happy to move it up. Yes. Okay. Oh, I, I, I misunderstood you. Every minute. Okay. So we're going to take agenda item number uh, seven now. And that is a council discussion, possible approval of resolution R2019-07, declaring as a public record a certain document filed with the town clerk and entitled 2019 Development Impact Fees Ordinance and placed on the agenda by the finance director, uh, it, Mr. Wedigan. If, if I could just clarify, oh, it was, so we have a resolution and ordinance because the ordinance itself had uh, a few pages, I forget how many there were, 20, 28 pages. Um, there's a process allowed where we can declare it a public record under by resolution, and then uh, once the ordinance is adopted, we publish the ordinance, so we don't have to pu publish 28 pages. Um, but uh, so that 
that's what that process is. So, so they're related. Resolution and the ordinance are related. The resolution simply declares it a public record first, and then you have an ordinance uh, first reading. You can have the discussion on, on the uh, okay, ordinance. Okay, so basically we don't want to talk about it now. We just want to make it public and then uh, no, move no. on to eight. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mr. Wedigan, you can sit back down for a minute if you want to. <laughs> there is public comment on this portion of it. That's why I said. Do we have any? It would be more appropriate for people if they speak on, want to speak to this to be on the uh, next agenda item, which is eight. Because we're going to make it public now. Yeah. Thank you. So we'll get with that. All righty. We'll go back to council. Um, I'll go ahead and do it. Motion to approve resolution number R2019-07, resolution of the mayor and town council of the town of Cave Creek, Maricopa County, Arizona, declaring as a public record a certain document filed with the town clerk entitled 2019 Development Impact of Fees Ordinance. Do we have a second? Second. Oh. All right. So we, since we have to do this, make it public, here we go. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I clearly have it. Agenda item number eight, council discussion approval of first reading of ordinance number 2019-03, amending the various sections of the town of Cave Creek Town Code, chapter 151, entitled Building Regulations Established an Effective Date, providing for repeal and severability and declared to be a public record by resolution number R2019-07. Now, Mr. Wedigan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, basically, why this had to come to be is that the development impact fee ordinance that we currently have, which also includes the actual development impact fees, the justification for the government, general government development impact fee basically runs out July 1. Um, so we needed to do something to um, either find a way to justify extending it or to eliminate it. So what we happened upon was an opportunity to modify the code, to bring it up to date, to make use of uh, what's been established as a model development impact fee code, um, and um, to update the code and also make it the most flexible as possible. This also in turn, however, invalidates the uh, development impact fee for parks. And basically, the dollar amount for parks that we'd collected uh, is less than $30,000 since August 2014. But the cost of renewing the development impact fee study, which should be done probably about every five years, plus the cost of administering that sole development impact fee, and the cost, uh, which includes the uh, cost of a biannual audit, and the cost of bookkeeping, um, essentially in annual reporting um, for, for development impact fees exceeded the amount that we were deriving from its, uh, from having it. So, plus also the uh, related IIP too would have to, the related capital improvement plan associated with the development impact fee, so um, is outdated as well and needs to be updated. That's part of the rate study, the development impact fee study. Um, so this just looked like an opportunity to eliminate kind of an un unnecessary burden on us relative to the amount of uh, income that we were derived from it. So uh, we did engage an attorney, uh, 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 Mr. McGuire from the firm of Gus Rosenfeld. And he had uh, access to this model, and he has updated it for our use. And uh, so basically, although this, although this will invalidate the dollar amounts associated with the fees, we can adopt once we have, uh, and if we choose to uh, re renew the development impact fee study, we have the ability to bring back to council that study as well as a resolution to adopt new development impact fees. The development impact fees, I uh, just wanted to point out, are different than capacity charges that we have. And so this is only relevant to the parks development impact fee and the general government development impact fee. And again, the general government development impact fee was used to pay essentially a portion of the cost of this structure that we're in um, and the other structures near us. So that's what it was established purpose was and that debt service is running out and uh, we'll make the final payment. And so. The need for the development impact fee as identified in the capital improvement plan associated with imposing the development impact fee is, is, run, is run out. So um, any questions for the attorney or me? 
It doesn't look like it. So a few more payments and the building's ours. Actually, one more payment. One more payment and the building's ours. Cool. Everybody, we own a building. Oh, um, maybe we can rent it out. Hmm? Maybe we can rent it out. Yeah, we do, part of it. <laughs> uh, we do. No question from council. All right, we have public comment on this item. Carrie Smith. Carrie Smith, 7265 East Continental Mountain Estates Drive. Um, yesterday, I sent the members of the council and uh, the town manager and Mr. Wedigan a brief summary of my understanding of what was going on, which is that there are two development impact fees, one labeled the general government development impact fee, and the second, the parks and trail development impact fee. The first of these, the general a government impact fee, as Mr. Wedigan suggested, is associated with the building and the annex building and paying that off. My understanding of the recommendation that was presented was that we eliminate that fee as well as the parks fee, and I'm asking that we instead study the possibility of retaining the general government development impact fee for other capital improvements that are necessary for the building and maintaining the structure, things like air conditioning, things like the parking lot, other things, not operating expenses, but rather capital expenditures. The Brookings Institution, which is a well-known research institution in Washington, D.C., associated with studying metropolitan governments, known to be somewhat liberal. And the Lincoln Land Institute, which is another more conservative institution, which also studies local governments, both recommend consideration of general government development impact fees as revenue tools, and we all know this town is continuously looking for opportunities to supplement revenue, and in addition, as vehicles for controlling and directing development in a community by those fees, and I think it is not prudent to uh, eliminate the fees completely. I have nothing to say about the code. I'm not qualified to talk about the code, but I think it is important to, to recommend a study of the general government development impact fee program as a vehicle both for revenue and for directing and encouraging or discouraging certain types of development. And that was not part of the analysis that was done. It seemed that that was uh, to be considered at some future date, and it looked like it was very costly. I don't necessarily think it's costly if we combine the evaluation of both of these impact fees in a single study which considers both the revenue implications of that and the ability to use them as vehicles to direct development, which is the way they are used all over Arizona and in most states of the United States. I can provide copies of the reports if anybody is interested. Thank you. Yes, I'm looking at you, Mr. McGuire. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Andrew McGuire from Gus Rosenfeld. Uh, I couldn't agree more that general government is a very important category of impact fees. Unfortunately, with Senate Bill 1525 in 2011, the Home Builders Association lobbied to eliminate general government as a fee category that you can collect. So the only categories you're allowed to collect for general government uses now are those for which you have what we referred to at the time as pledge debt. That means you had some sort of bond, uh, tax certificate, something that you had levied out there into the future to pay for some sort of infrastructure and you are now paying it back. And so among other things, general government, most buildings that were being financed with it were town hall buildings, uh, other public facilities. Libraries also took a big cut. You can only have 10,000 square feet now. Uh, all of those things for which you can no longer collect can only service the debt until the debt is gone. You're coming to that point at the end of this fiscal year, and so general government is no longer a category available to you from January or from July 1 going forward. 
so as I understand what we're doing here is we're, we're taking those away, but <clears throat> leaving a pathway open should we need them in the future to do another IAP and come up with a, with a need and, and then reinstitute for something that we've, we're taking a loan out on. Is that accurate or? I like it. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Uh, Mayor, Mr. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, there are, there are two different ways that you will be able to go forward. One is that you will have a fee ca category that is something that you've already collected money for that you have to expend before 2020. You don't have a lot of that. That's a small amount left in the, in the parks fund that will have to be expended as it was collected for uh, during that time period. And then you have the second half of it, which is currently allowed under the statute as a necessary public service. One of the main things that happened in 2011 when the home builders came to us with this lovely piece of legislation is that they took what was before a decision of the seven of you to decide what's a necessary public facility for our community. And you had communities that made different choices, like you know, in, in uh, Queen Creek, very horse-oriented community. They had arenas and, and their recreational items focused on, on equestrian uses. Those are specifically out of the, the current statute under Parks and Recreation. It's about a 15-line definition of what it can't be, and that's included in there. Unfortunately, the list that they created is very simple. Water, sewer, streets, parks of a certain size, pretty small actually, uh, libraries, police, and fire. And then they added one, which was surprising, that actually might be pretty beneficial to this community, which is drainage. Didn't exist in a lot of people's studies up until that point. And so there's actually a new category as of 2011 that wasn't there before. Uh, not a lot of communities have implemented for it because it's typically something handled by private development. But if you had a more regional uh, development need for a drainage facility, you could spread it amongst a bunch of developers uh, in a general area. That's the, the challenge that you face is that not only do you have a limitation on the number of things you can charge for, they have to be in a capital plan that becomes part of what we call the infrastructure improvements plan. That's what you have to update every five years. That's why right now there's a flurry of activity because the first requirement for this ordinance to go into place the first time that the, the 2011 statute was fully implemented was August 1st of 2014. So we're quickly getting to the five-year point at which everybody has to have re-upped their study. So if you stay in the game of development impact fees every five years, you pay a consultant to do the analysis that takes your, your capital plans and the financing necessary to get there, analyzes those two things together and produces a fee report that tells you how much you can charge for the growth related component of those elements. Not any of the deficiencies you may have in your, your system to date for current residents, only the growth component. So that, it makes it challenging to put a lot into those studies. Questions from Council? Councilman McGuire? Do you tend to agree with Mr. Wedigan that the amount of money that we could get is likely less than what we had to spend to get it? I always agree with the finance people because that's <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. Exactly. exactly. I, I know who writes the check to pay the bill, but nonetheless, <laughs> if your infrastructure improvements plan doesn't have a sufficient amount of of capital in it. If you don't have, if, and if you're down to just parks, you'd have to have a lot of parks in your plan in order to be generating the kind of revenue that would make the fee study make sense. Now, to be fair, the fee study cost gets rolled into the development impact fee itself, but it's in arrears. You're always paying for the prior study with your next, and with the size of your current fee, it would take you quite a while to pay for even the cost of the study. Um, and I'm, I'm friends with the gentleman who does your study. He's probably not very happy that I'm speaking uh, against his interests at the moment, but it really is a, a numbers game that if you don't have a certain number of impact fees in your IIP, it starts to become cost prohibitive. And there are a number of communities in Arizona that didn't have a lot of things they put into those fee studies that just decided they were done in 2014. Others are finding their way there as you go along. You're a little bit unique because your two bigger fees, the things that you would normally do that would cost more are handled through connection fees rather than through development impact fees. Uh, other communities are doing that as well. So it really leaves not much on the table for your development impact fee study. Nope. 
Oh, you got another one? Okay. Katja Kensel. Thank you for that explanation. We need to hire him <laughs> to match any fees, development fees, impact fees, with our capital improvement program, uh, which is coming up for um, discussion in a week or two, I understand, and it <coughs> needs a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you. That all? Okay, we're back to council. Well, can Carrie mm -hmm. do what? Carrie respond. He's got a question. I just want to ask a question of the lawyer. That's a, sure. Is that yeah, a, go ahead. Uh, my question. It'll help. Us say, um, but please speak into the microphone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, did you say that water infrastructure could qualify for development impact fees or not? I'm chairman of the Water Advisory Committee, and one of the items on the agenda for Wednesday is the capital improvement projects designated for the town, which are very diversified. and. I wasn't aware that we could use capital improvement fees for that. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you. For yeah, because we're looking at that. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, one of the categories of necessary public services is, and I think we have it actually in the, the model ordinance, uh, almost exactly as it is in the, the statute. It's a cate category that includes but is not limited to facilities necessary to provide water services to development, including acquisition, supply, transportation, treatment, purification, distribution of water, and all appurtenances to those facilities. And then you have something similar for wastewater as well. Um, one of the things that this doesn't address, though, is the more recent uh, clampdown on acquisition using development fees to pay for uh, condemnation of water companies. Uh, right after Buckeye went down that road and acquired the global water system, we had some changes to the water fee statute that you probably see when you do your, your rate study and, and those uh, related. Uh, and the, it's similar to an IIP, but it's not really like an IIP. We've resisted that greatly. So when you come to your water study with your connection fees and your capacity fees and all the things that you have included in there, those are very similar to this. So you would have either one or the other. You would do one under 95512, which is the, the rate study and, and capacity charge, or you would have development impact fee, but you really can't do both with respect to new growth. With respect to current residents, you can yes, certainly have uh, the water study. Vice Mayor? I'd like to uh, kind of enlarge on that. Uh, a number of years ago, we had a choice of uh, going through what I considered a rather onerous effort to do development fee continuation. And we had had development fees. We stopped the development fees for water infrastructure and uh, utilized capacity fees. Now, my understanding is that doing development fees, we need to establish a whole different structure to enable us to do that. And that's one of the reasons why the town went to capacity fees. Is has anything changed in that in that uh, area that would make us go, oh boy, we can go development fees instead of capacity fees? Um, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, I would not recommend it simply because the process for adopting your rate study, including capacity fees and uh, and user charges is substantially less onerous than the process for adopting development impact fees, but not because of the studies that go into them. The study you do to try and determine capacity charges is similar to what's done for a, a development impact fee, but the process, the timing process that was imposed in the statute, when we first calculated it out trying to get an idea of how long it takes, from the beginning of a study until adoption and implementation is about 270 days. So it's the better part of a year to go from ground zero to adopt a development impact fee. Whereas if you're doing a rate study with a component for capacity and in, in some cases a standby component as well, some communities use that, those things can be done in a much shorter period of time because as soon as you get through your study, you're then down to a 60-day window rather than 
75 days tacked on the end of a 270 day process. And capacity fees can be adjusted to take into account new uh, uh, accounting problems with like big debts, additional debt. Um, your, your fee consultants will tell you how much you can adjust your capacity fees to do that. Uh, but I can tell you statutorily they are much more easily amended than development impact fees. Thank you. Any other questions from council? We're back to council for a motion. I'm 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 wait I'm in the thing, so if you can have it. I will go be ahead. happy to do Thank the you. motion. <laughs> Where is that stuff? Um, there we go. Gotta go to the front. Uh, this is number eight, right? Eight, yes. Yeah. Motion to give first reading to ordinance uh zero two thousand nineteen hyphen zero three. An ordinance of the mayor and council of the town of Cape Creek, Maricopa County, Arizona, adopting by reference the 2019 Development Impact Fees Ordinance, uh, semicolon, amending various sections of chapter 151, paren, building regulations and paren of the town of Cave Creek uh, town code by repealing certain sections thereof relating to development fees and replacing them with the 2019 Development Impact Fees Ordinance semicolon, establishing an effective date, comma, and protect, uh, providing for repeal of inconsistent ordinances and declared to be a public record by resolution number R, 2019-07. Second. Comment? Well, you, uh, yeah, it, you, can, you can say something about it if you want. I, I will say something. This is something that has come up uh, for several years uh, in, in discussion of uh, development of the town budget. And every time it comes up, it's we really need to do something about this. Because what, what happens is the revenue that is gained from what we have in place right now is hardly adequate to pay for uh, the requirements for audit and all sorts of other things that are needed. And if we have to do a, a major, uh, even a small study to uh, redo, re, uh, redo this, it, 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 it's not money wise. And so uh, I certainly would, I, I believe this is something that needs to be done. It's, it had to be done two years ago, but we never got around to do it. Hmm. Comment, Councilman McGuire? Yeah, I think the, the purposes that Dr. Smith were talking about are very important, but it makes so much more sense to get them into the capacity phase. <coughs> Oh. Uh, well, yeah, my comment is um, it was about as clear as mud to some degree in reading this as a council person without the attorneys here. Yeah. And to clarify uh, what it was that was missing, because I had a lot of questions until we got clarity. So, appreciate it. Thank you. That's why I moved him up so we'd all still be awake. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes clearly have it. Seven, nothing. Uh, let's bounce back to num agenda item number six because we got some people sitting around here waiting on that one as well. Uh, council consideration discussion regarding ordinance 2017-07 amending town code section 130.16 entitled fireworks with possible direction to staff. I wasn't ready to jump up that quick until you, you said You want me to go back to five? No, it's okay. We're okay with six. Okay. I just... Um, thank you, Mayor, Mr. members of the council. Um, a little background about the fireworks ordinance is um, our current fireworks ordinance was brought forward by a former council member and was passed on June 19, 2017. It did not go into effect with a 30-day wait until Jan or July 1917, which was after the 4th of July fireworks that occurred that year. So the current or ordinance limits the uh, use of consumer fireworks. Those are fireworks that you can buy at the fireworks stands um, for personal use. It does limit those consumer fireworks to only be used in the zoning districts of the town core and also in general commercial, and then also on any public golf course. The ordinance further limits the uh, use of those fireworks to only occurring between June 24th and July 6th, 
and then again December 24th to January 3rd. At no other time are you allowed to use consumer fireworks anywhere in the town. That does not preclude the use of what the state defined as novelty items. Those are gonna be your sparklers, your the little fireworks that you see the kids running around with. Um, firework displays. Those are gonna be the public events where we're gonna see the large firework displays going off. Those are only allowed by permit. And each permit is required um, by the applicant and they have to apply, provide, do you have the, uh, Perfect. Thank you, Robert. They have to provide, including their application, a site plan indicating where the spectators are, spectators are gonna be located and the minimum secured diameter of the site as required by the NFPA 1123, which is the National Fire Protection Agency standard on display fireworks. They also have to provide insurance, naming the town as additional insured. Uh, in the amount of one million general liability plus an additional five million in um, excess liability. They need to bring to the town a commitment from a fire department to provide on-site equipment and personnel in the event of a fire or a medical emergency. And then they also need to provide a written plan for in the unlikely case that a mortar doesn't go off or fails to light, so it's stuck in the tube. So at that point in time, it becomes an emergency around there. We don't want them going off and blowing up. So also in the ordinance, it uh, says that permits shall not be issued in times of fire, high fire danger. The town uses the National Fire Danger Rating System to notify the community the current fire threat level. Um, let's pull one up here. Brian, we're not sharing right now. There we go. So the National Fire Danger Rating System consists of multiple levels. Um, it, it's highly recognized as probably the, one, the, the biggest used rating system in the United States to notify the public of what the fire danger is. It has a low level, a moderate level, of high, very high, and then extreme. According to our ordinance, anytime we have a high level danger, we're not allowed to issue any permits for display fireworks. Now, the idea is how do we come to the idea of what that level is? We use a, a variety of sources. The most prevalent source that we're gonna use is the Tano National Forest, the Cave Creek District. They have, uh, they use the exact same system they set up and it's located not far from town here, about halfway to Payson. Which, if you start thinking about that, it's probably got a little bit more moisture up there than what we actually gather here in the town. The, um, we also have an opportunity to recently to go ahead and take a look at um, the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. Um, they gave us access to their back of the house, and I was able to download a list of the Arizona communities most at risk. They did a study of 400 communities within the state of Arizona, and I sorted it out to where we were just in Maricopa County here. And all in all, uh, you'll see Cave Creek is listed at number five, and Maricopa County is the uh, fifth highest community at risk of a wildfire. Um, it also includes Desert Hills and Joy Ranch, which is just right here, and then also Anthem. So you can see at the top three there are just here in the north part of the valley for us. Um, we did rank number 773 out of the entire state of 400. So when we're talking about our rating system as it is today, I mentioned that we use the um, Tano National Forest, the Cave Creek Rangers District, their site. If you look at, this is from this morning, I printed it out to get the most accurate. They list themselves as low right now in the fire rating system. As you walk outside, you notice that our Globe Cal meal is just about to a um, straw state. I, I thought about grabbing some today 
and putting it in the parking lot and see if it would just go ahead and light and I decided against it. <laughs> But um, they they're showing as low. So we haven't increased our rating system at all. Um, we also talked with uh, Row Metro about our fire system, rating system. Anytime I go out and we decide that we need to elevate that, we look at not only the uh, Tano National Forest, I talk to Row Metro and get their input on it. Then we also take a look at the Arizona State uh, hotline for closures and restrictions. Call that to make sure that there aren't any unknown restrictions in the area that would cause us to change it any further. Um, so with all that being said, without the ability to go ahead and spend tens of thousands of dollars to create, to have the equipment on site, to train employees, to actually do the fire um, science studies, we have to rely on the other jurisdictions and people around us in order to come to that standard. And I also have, because this is all about the fireworks ordinance here, I have Chief Kratz here this evening that would be more than happy to talk to you about challenges they've had with fires in the past when we had fireworks. And then we also have um, Dennis Rohrman, <clears throat> who is filling in for Chief while he's out on medical. We thank the Chief for coming in right now, because uh, if you all notice, he's, he's slung up over there. And Dennis happens to be the uh, senior member for the Wildland er Interface for Rural Metro 2. He has a lot of experience in environments like ourselves here, where we are just a stone's throw away from no other houses out there and just wide open areas. And with that, um, if council has any questions, be more than happy to answer them. Councilman Morris? Well, is, is Chief Kraft gonna make a statement? I'm just here for, to answer questions if you have any. Well, um, have we had fires due to fireworks? <laughs> Come on up. <clears throat> Good thing you're right-handed. I've, I've seen you drink. So do I. Oops, chair for you. Want to come for him? Yeah, okay. They slide into his head. So, may, Mayor, members of the council, in response to the question about events in the past, we have a pretty heavy presence there. In fact, we turn out our entire fire departments in Cave Creek and Carefree during the uh, fireworks shoot at Herald's every year, and we have for the last 24, 24 or five years. We also bring in um, Wildland Division firefighters when available um, in the past years. I will say that we have had startups, small little startups, quite often to answer your question. We're there and we put them out rapidly, but fireworks in, a, in an environment like we're in can start fires. And uh, we've had them in the past. They've never gotten out of control, but we've had small startups. Hope that answers your question. And um, after the show's over, how long does do you typically remain on site to prevent you know smolders and we're there a good hour after the event. What happens is they, there's different types of fireworks. So there's the aerials that go up, and then there's what they call cakes. And those cakes have, Dan, 100, 200 small, yeah. small fireworks in a box. When they all take off within a couple seconds, those boxes catch on fire out in the parking lot, away from the brush and stuff, but out in the parking lot. Well, we stay there to make sure those are out completely before we leave. Typical preparations prior to the um, the events. What have you typically done in the past, as far as? Well, Rural Metro itself doesn't do anything. It, it's it's put on the business owner to do the prep, which is some brush cleanup, some watering of of the area. But Rural Metro itself doesn't do any prep. Okay. Um, several years ago, about, uh, to the north side of the Kite property, there was a pretty good one, as I recall, it was about a quarter acre that got 
got a little burnt, got a little black. And Actually, there was two different fires, one right behind the library and right at the people's property just to the north side of that site. Um, we managed to get them out, but they were significant in starts that they were a fair distance away from where the fireworks were being shot off. And that was just a natural tendency for the wind to carry those embers a little farther than, than the uh, site could hold them in. But we were there and we put them out. We put this stuff out rapidly. Yeah, I saw that. I'm like, oh. Council, um, how much water does it take to make that not happen? And how far outside of the, the blast radius or the fallout radius would you actually need to be, uh, assuming that there's zero wind? If, if there's no wind, uh, the immediate area, but we can't predict the wind. So. Right. It is far as far out as we can and we can make that um, we call it pre treating the fuel so um, fuel reduction fuel reduction is, is taking away fuels mm -hmm. the fine the grasses the weeds and then uh, you know whatever else is out there to put fuel moisture back into the vegetation um, two couple days in advance as far off out as is we honestly can predict when to be um, Right. And that's the beginning of monsoons as well. So. True. Yeah, yeah one, one thing that Chief Orman said to me the other day, that pre-treating is only good for a couple days prior to an event. You go out a week, you know, some people think, well, let's make somebody water for three weeks before the event. And as he said, all that does is grow more weeds. Yeah, yeah like the other, the other morning after we had 1,600 some inch of rain in town, uh, I took my propane torch to see just how volatile the, or how fast that the globe, globe chamomile would go up and I couldn't make it burn. Well, if and, you it, re and it was dry. If you remember his presentation, the, the marshals just a minute ago, mm -hmm. and the fact that the chief had a uh, propane burning event today. today. Don't do that anymore, please. <laughs> it, 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 it was one isolated one in mid, it, you know, 25 feet from the nearest thing with no wind, and it was high humidity as well. So, I just had to give you. I was just, I just wanted to see if it'd go up or not. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So, given <clears throat> the conditions that you heard about tonight by Mr. Baxley and the statistics that we're all aware of, how dry the conditions are. In your professional opinion, should we move forward, or should Danny move forward um, with with the fireworks? Well, the question puts us in a spot that we can't really a answer accurately. We can't predict wind. We can't predict temperature and humidity on a given day months from now. So I would be hesitant to say one way or the other. I believe that's up to your town staff and you folks to figure that out. Rural Metro does what it can to mitigate an event once it occurs. Um, we're there to help. We're, the, we're there to keep the community safe. But the way your system works, we're not the one that calls the shots. And again, I would be very hesitant to say one way or the other because we can't predict what's going to happen on July 3rd on whatever today's date is. Okay. Does Danny get a chance to speak? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there'll be. It's, I guess that's my question. What are we doing tonight? Are we? We're, we're, we're actually looking at this to hear the whole thing and decide if there's some safe way to actually pull off it, pull anything off or not. I think it's, and then if there is, if we if we decide there is, then we would ask staff to go back and and do some some massaging to the to the thing. Um, Mayor, if, if yeah. I might clarify, the, the from staff's perspective, um, Mr. Baxley highlighted what is contained in the criteria of the ordinance and staff is not recommending that you make any change uh, to the ordinance itself. Then part two is he um, summarized uh, the permit process and the criteria that the staff is looking at to 
you know, professionally evaluate whether or not the town staff should issue a permit. And there's a permit process that needs to take place. Now, should a permit be allowed with that criteria, and that, again, is public discussion on whether or not the criteria that staff is using to evaluate whether or not the permit should even be issued to begin with, um, that's up for discussion, but uh, I think staff will tell you, particularly from uh, Mike's perspective, we're looking at everything that's out there and available to us. Uh, then at some point you, we have to make a decision and then issue a permit and, and then some of the other criteria are, well, if we issue a permit, then what do we do? Do we do this and this and this? And I think when, when Danny comes to speak, you're going to hear uh, you know, things that he might be able to do if we even issued a permit. And so we have to get through the permit process to be able to prepare the ground, watering, what, what are those criteria, what Rometer would do, how you're going to measure the wind, what, uh, what instruments do we make available to us to measure those you know, correctly and, and safely to make the community as safe as possible. Those are the kinds of things that you have to get past the permit process to look at those other issues. And I think we need to hear from Danny what his concerns are, and then have that discussion about the criteria. Councilman Clancy? Yeah, I, it, it sounded like, based on what you showed us with regards to what people can and cannot do in, in basically their own backyard this coming season is pretty strenuous, mm -hmm. particularly if neighbors haven't cut down the areas around them and they're shooting off rockets legally or illegally. But, because um, I, th I think the town has a requirement not only at the core, but also the public as a whole, who, who are on, you know, neighbor to neighbor, but five acres or three acres or 20 acres, to ensure that their property doesn't become a fire hazard to their neighbor. I know it's daunting because I look at my property and go, holy smoke! I mean, I can do it around my house. I can do it down one hill and maybe the other, but two and a half acres down towards row wash, I'm not sure I really want to get down all the way down there and have to start clearing that out. But it depends what the neighbor in front of me does with fireworks, I suppose. But it, it's, a, it's a daunting task, and I think that for me as an individual, it has to do with the health, safety, and welfare of everybody. So um, I think staff is the one who's got to carry the burden right up until it gets closer. That's kind of how I'm looking at it. Um, <laughs> and there's always drones. They look quite lovely in the air. So anyway, um, and that's a statement. Sorry, there's not a question yeah. in it. Councilman Morris. Can, can we, what is the worst thing that can happen? D define, define the, the area, the area, and the severity of what could happen right. um, with your best. Give me the mouse and turn that over. W would the answer be Paradise, California? Um, well, I wasn't going to ever use that <laughs> analogy. You want the website up? Yes. Okay. So one now, of the tools. I'm not talking about in, in general. I'm talking about the specific location. I'm going to give you some specific locations about. right now. So um, we recently. I re recently got access to the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management Wildfire Risk Assessment Portal, their back of the house piece. And what this says, right now I have this set on the wildfire risk assessment that they had as part of their, their total study. And if we are to look at Cave Creek, this being right here, the Cave Creek area. And if you look on the bottom here, we start looking at the risk that they have set there. And as we zoom in, you can see where we're at, and we can also pull up things like, uh, we'll use a base map of the uh, aerial here. And we can look and we can find out normally where this is going to take place. This is, this is the launch area right here, okay? What's surrounding it here is going to be the very high area threat. 
The area right here off to the side where he launches, this little piece right here is where it get, typically gets launched, is going to be in the um, highest category. Now, that's the risk as we're looking forward. We can also take a look at what they did with this study and we can look at what our threat is. And our threat is showing us the likelihood of having a fire in this area at this location is gonna be in the moderate to high area. So it's trying to tell us that we have vegetation there and it's gonna burn. Wow. Was that risk right now or is that all the time? That's a year round. That is, that's actually as they update it throughout the year. But what's, what was the date on that one? I couldn't. They don't have, the, the date wasn't on there. When I pulled this up, this was this morning. Okay. Have you done these kinds of analyses over the last 25 years? No. Have I done them over the last, I've done them over the last few years. Because we've been hosting these fireworks for 25 years and. We the have. community loves it, and, and I know that it's risky, and we are very concerned about safety. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what Danny has to say, how he's prepared. I think it's probably time for Danny to step up and start beating on us. That's the amount of handouts, which you got. I called him up for you, Jane. Is that all right? Can I pass these up? Sure. <coughs> you got DVDs, but just for reiteration, just some questions going through. <coughs> Mayor and Council, thank you. I, this may go over three minutes. Is there a process of handling that, or I only got my three minutes? I have stuff, so I'm still left on my time. Okay. So I appreciate, uh, well, really all the attention. I mean, I was here for rodeo, which was great, and I got to see Adam's nice fire presentation, which has kind of set the tone for the evening. And uh, then we also got to give out a couple of checks, but I'll get into it. So obviously, we've been doing this for tw 25 years. Uh, we have a business in town. The last thing, most important thing, is town safety. No one's gonna dis discredit that. We live in a desert, we've been living in a desert, for, I've been living in a desert for over 30 years. We've never had an incident. We've been using larger shells, as I preface this, this state, statement, what I'm gonna read. And uh, I will go to, uh, not a selfish thing, but I'm gonna go out of order of what I wrote and go with the economic impact. And then I'll go into my uh, reasons why I disagree with Mr. Baxley on the risk assessment. So just the economic impact um, on, on this in the last couple of years. So yet last year, losing our fireworks show, um, the 3rd of July then brings over 5,000 residents and visitors to our, our town and it has our local townspeople celebrating our country's Independence Day. This event has gone over, on for 25 years. It was created out of necessity uh, for the town businesses to survive and uh, stay open in the summer months during the slow businesses. Obviously, it's a lot more population than it was uh, 25 years ago, but there's still a dire need for business in the, in the summertime and all the business core is reflected by tax revenue. So over those years, we've brought in all these people. In the last year, uh, the town businesses that I reached out to, five specific, I came up with an assessment of what it cost us by not having it. The cancellation of the last year's show cost the local businesses over $150,000 in sales. And that's only five businesses. It also cost 100 employees of those businesses work and wages estimated over $15,000 to combined income. These are people that def definitely need money and count on those summer events to help survive and uh, pay for summer vacations or extra things they need in the, in the summertime to slow months. The loan revenue uh, from the uh, resorts and uh, Prickly Pear Inn, the cancellation wasn't even included in some of that. So there is a great economic impact. And again, that is last on the list for most of safety. So my facts and reasoning, and, and um, I don't have the pretty tools like Mike does, and he does these back channel things. If I can get some of that stuff, I could really come up with some. But, and the points are all well taken, and you see it. And it, yeah, it's, it's discouraging. Yeah, that's not my current one. I've, I've stepped up my game a little bit. Thank, thank so. So I'll, I'll just read through some of what I had. So the, 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 one, the, the town code was created, and the ordinance was created in, in good faith, right? Good intentions, but it's flawed. It's, it's ambiguous at best. And you heard Mike say, well, we use this, and then we use this determination. Well, which one do you use? 
And if you're going to create a code and you go specific, then be specific. Um, it has date sensitive that we didn't even fire last year. You guys were gracious enough to let us do our, uh, our uh, Labor Day uh, fireworks show because we had to supply and we needed the business. And that would actually fell out of the uh, code. Um, and the intentions is nothing negative. I understand the safety factor of it. But the determining factor was fire danger rating, which was never defined to me when I was going through all my homework um, by anybody in town other than a couple different um, different scenarios that could be. And I, my gather information today, they use the NFDRS, National Fire Danger Rating System. And um, to me, that's flawed. Three there will always be high fire danger in Arizona in July. It has always been. It's been very high, and maybe it's sometimes extreme. We've had a show for 25 years. We've never had a problem. Using the, uh, the fire danger system, which was created to provide knowledge for fed federal wildlands, and those, labels, those levels were used to help Forest Service and visitors make decisions about whether or not to have campfires activities that create risk in fire. National Forests could even restrict those activities. And in our National Forest, same thing, Tonto National Forest, as Mike said earlier, based off of those fire danger levels. Fire levels are determined by National Forests and our local Forest Service uh, at, on a variety of factors. The amount of burning fuels. And boy, do we have a lot of burning fuels because of uh, the rain and the chamomile. That was another nice presentation by, by Luke. Um, and I, I admit to that. But it also provide a lot of moisture for some of the uh, trees and cactuses. And that's the other part of what they determine. They go out into a forest area and they take samplings. And I think Mike said it was closer to Prescott where they do their sampling. Was that no. the statement you made? Between here and Payson. Here and Payson. And Mike says it's a little moisture. It's still dry at all times. The, the flawed part of it, the, the service people, what they do, they cut samplings and they take it to dehydrate, and that's their moisture level. Using the code to determine and cancel the event that, that brought so much and has been so safe over those years and never created a problem was your, the, the code is that fire danger is rated from a forest service for federal wildlands, forest areas with limited accessibility. They don't have the accessibility as a town core does. They don't have the dense vegetation as, as the national, our town doesn't have dense vegetation in the town core as a national forest. Her, Harold's parking lot in the fallout area is not town, town and national forest. Our, for, our fallout area has less than 5% vegetation as seen on map B in your guide. Dirt does not catch on fire. And you can make an argument about the ground fuel that's been there. We have already uh, cleared 75% of the fallout zone from all that chamomile and weeds. And we have plans to continue to clear all of the uh, ground fuel um, debris and plus extend into our neighbors an extra 50 to 100 feet deemed necessary if we are graciously allowed to go forward with rural metro's advisement. That ground fuel will be cleared. Harold's. Um, we institute a watering plan, plan like uh, Marshall, uh, uh, Fire Chief Kratz said in years past. We can start that plan earlier. It, and I know John said you don't have to set it a couple of days early, but one of the determining factors of uh, the high fire danger is the hydration level of those plants. We could start it early and keel, still keep the area beyond the fallout area clean from ground fuels. The only ve vegetation that may be a concern falls outside the fallout area, but it is readily available, accessible, with the uh, addition of Cartwright Pass, shown on Map C. Rural Metro fire trucks and brush trucks set up on that perimeter of that fallout area can send water over 100 feet, if I'm not mistaken, John. I didn't have that fact. Can you shoot those brush trucks 100 feet out or fire trucks 100 feet out of water? We can extend hose 1,000 feet out. So Rural Metro typically can extend way beyond that fallout area to handle any of those brush fires that have occurred in the past, and that's all that has ever occurred in the past on our property. Um, they also usually have a similar crew, 12 or more firefighters with extinguishers to handle any hotspots, areas that the truck may not be able to extend to or get to. So with rural metro supervision and site planning, the safety work has been done and will be done. It's always been done for 25 years since there's never been a problem. Uh, we've done a show safely for 24 years. If you look at uh, map A, those are five inch shells with that fallout area. You see the difference. 24 years of shooting a show, 23 years of shooting a show with that shell size, with more, more metro on site, 
We've never had anything significant in a couple of brush fires. I heard somebody earlier talk about Bob's Kite property. The significance with that and why that occurred, because they were using larger shells, and John, you can correct me if I'm wrong, with the wind containment, those shells with the fallout radius is a much wider land that's on, not as controlled. We have purposely downsized our shells to 2.5. I mean, there are shells that you can buy in public at, or an inch wide. And these shells limit the height and fallout of those debris, which is in a lot safer, smaller, containable area, going above and beyond what we've done in 25 years with safe shows. My, my purpose here is to say, hey, change the ordinance, ordinance to more, be more common sense with the foremost of safety. I do agree fireworks should not be shot, be allowed, if not fired by a licensed pyrotechnician does not have rural metro supervision and passes an on-site inspection. Fire sh fireworks should not be shot in inclement weather where wind gusts ex would exceed 15 miles an hour. 15 miles an hour. The only time work if fireworks cannot be safely shot in town is when an extreme fire danger or when rural metro is possibly dealing with a fire that is out of control in the wildlands and no resources may be needed to use for that fire. With supervision of Royal Metro over the last 24 years and us going down to a 2.5 shell to mitigate the fallout area, I truly believe you guys should bring back the 25-year tradition and not prohibit traditions like the Bloom Festival from going through an ambiguous, arbitratious code that was written in good intentions but has the unintentional um, consequences of generating business and providing a tradition that's happened over 24 years. Any questions that I am sort of educated on, I can provide with you. We have our pyrotechnician here, Dan Nelson, who's shot all the shows. I think the big point for us is to look at the high fire danger in the commercial core, where it is applicable in the residential areas when you're backing up to Tunnel National Forest. Councilman Morris. How, how do you deal with the fault with the surrounding properties? That obviously I can see you, you don't own a lot of the property that, that is in the green area here. Well, um, if, if you look at the, 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 one, the 175 foot shot, or actually Mike's see. got a nice map of it up there. That is all our area, except a little bit to the, no, it's all our area. And the adjacent areas where we would extend, and I have talked to about clearing brush, is Larry Wentz area, which is directly south of ours, and then Matt Grace's area, which is directly east of ours. And, and do they all, they all give permission to do this? To clear the brush, yeah. So, yes, so uh, obviously with the Buffalo ship, it, it's a financial I'm sorry. gain also. So they're, Larry's on board with clearing any debris or doing a watering program if necessary. And the, if, you, if you had a bigger uh, blow up of the area, the area behind us, which actually leads up to the mountain, there is a paved, not a paved road, there's a graded, not graded, there's a road that a brush truck can get 100 to 200 feet into that area um, to be situated, which to me, in my opinion, over doing these shows over years and um, minimalizing the fought area, is your only really concern is going up that backside. Do you have rural metro trucks on the backside? We, John will have the ability to put a brush truck if needed all the way down there. I would not do the show, shot, the show or a firework display without rural metro's uh, site, site inspection or, or approval. It doesn't make any sense to do so without it. I just think the ordinance as it's currently written for good intentions has, has taken away a 25 year tradition, has hurt our economic uh, times in the summer and it's an overreaction to a situation when you put professionals in charge with supervision from Royal Metro, downsizing everything to be even more, more safe and more secure, um, it should be reconsidered in my opinion. Anybody else? Nope. Uh, Thank you. Um, we have speakers. Somebody is no longer here that had told me that he was watching the, the fireworks one year from a place. What's that road that's, that is around the corner of Bella Vista, this one that goes back south? What is that road? Um, 
gosh, I can't remember it either. Grand Drive. The second house down on the east side of that road, there was there was there was hot embers falling on that property when you guys were shooting one year. That is so far outside the, the your your five and a half inch. It must have been a wind drift issue. I mean, that's that's twice your radius. I, I, I don't know what you're referring to. All I know is it's a five inch shell. And those five inch shells do go, and Dan can probably explain the technical part of it better, do go a lot higher and so are more susceptible to wind and a greater, uh, greater distance to go far up. That's a fact. Those two inch shells go up. What's the difference in height between five and 150 feet? What's a five inch shell go up to? 300, 300. And so when you're dealing with a 10, 50 mile an hour wind at that height, of course those ambers would magnify the uh, radius of a fallout area. Okay. What happens in your business if, if at the time that, it, that it's time for the show to start, that the winds come in and they're blowing 10 miles an hour or something, and you're, you're going to be drifting way beyond your radius that you're talking about. Bottom. <laughs> that's, that's we, we've, had, we've done a show for 24 years. So uh, we've, the one time a storm picked up when Chief Kratz was on presence, do not fire the show, Danny. I got, I got 1,000 people here, John. We waited about 45 minutes, an hour and a half. Wind died down. They felt safe. We shot. We do do some test shells to see where the wind and where the potential debris would be falling. We do that before every show anyhow. Um, I think that what you're referencing with the size of the shell and going that much higher, an extra 150 feet in the air, that is going to possibly get it to that area. But you're, you're, we're talking about downsizing a two and a half inch shell. All right. Thank you. I think you got some more, uh, some more forms now since Danny started talking. Beth Cornell. Well, I property owner. Yeah, I am now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment that I've enjoyed that show for many, many years yeah. before I... Yes, I am. Um, I've enjoyed it for many years before I was a resident and would like to enjoy it again. And I hope that the council and staff can take a hard look at what it is that's preventing it from happening and find a safe way that it can happen. Um, just sitting here, it sounded like there may be, needs to be a closer timeline for maybe even approval or a way, you know, to rely on a, a resource that's local that would, if necessary, have to cancel a show like that. Because I know last year the show got canceled and the forests up north were all, there were as many firework displays in other communities at the same time with the same kind of fire restrictions. So that's all I had to say on it. I did enjoy the show, and as a resident, I'd like to enjoy it in the future if it's possible. Thank you. Eileen Wright. Eileen Wright, Cave Creek resident. I remember this code vividly in 2017. Mr. Baxley and I were burned alive at the stake for bringing it forward. It is an outstanding code. It came from the Arizona League of Cities and Towns who are the master at this. It is not a flawed document. That is not my opinion. That is, it is just not a flawed document. But a quick question before I go on. Exactly what are you going to ask the staff to do? to make changes to accommodate a business and to risk the town? Or what changes would you be asking them to make to this code? You don't know. OK, that's what I thought. OK, so what's the reason for doing any of this to begin with? Health, safety, welfare. The safety of our town comes first, period. And if I'm listening to all this, I hear economic impact. I hear the ordinance is flawed. But we also forget we're in the middle of a 20-year drought. And it gets worse and worse. Have you ever seen these chamomiles look like this before? I haven't. We are in a dangerous situation. And it isn't a time to 
accommodate special interest groups. It's a time to look at your residents, to look at your town, and even from where I live, I can look up on the hill and see the burn spot where the fire came over the hill in 2004. What we're talking about is losing our town. It's not a game. Mr. Baxley did an outstanding job. He was crucified for doing an outstanding job. We need to look at what, we ha what, what we're about, the safety of our town. Thank you. Carrie Smith. Kurt Smith, 7265 East Continental Mountain Estates a Drive. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, there's always fire danger, as was suggested in the previous comments. The issue is the incremental risk that we as a town are deciding to impose on ourselves in the interests of what is uh, arguably a very nice show and people appreciate it over the holidays. The question ultimately is private gains versus public interest. And the statute was introduced in an effort to try to make that balance between private gains versus public interest. I do economic impact analysis all the time. I understand exactly what's involved in that, and I don't think you should be swayed by those analyses, because the fact of the matter is, if the dollars aren't spent there, they're spent someplace else. Now, you're going to say, well, they're not spent in Cave Creek. Don't be so sure of that, okay? Don't be so sure of that. Um, another way we get economic impact is to have buildings burned down as a result of that, and they'll be spending to build it back up again. We certainly don't want that. So that's another way we can get economic impacts. I would prefer to retain a statute which is complex. It's trying to balance that private interest and public risk, and it's trying to take account of the information that's available and make the best judgment possible to simplify the statute and to eliminate the nuances that are associated with making that best judgment is simply poor policy. It does not make sense. The town staff should be trusted to make that judgment and do it to their best knowledge. As far as why hasn't that been necessary or why isn't there the map technology that we saw associated with the most recent analysis, it's very simple. 25 years ago, the geographic information systems that are associated with doing that fire assessment did not exist. They exist now. I taught at a place uh, Arizona State University that pioneered in that GIS information. It has enhanced the way we do fire management all around the West, and it is an innovation that we should not say, because it didn't exist 25 years ago, we can ignore it today. We should not ignore it today. We should take account of it today. Thank you. Katja Kinsel. <clears throat> Katja Kinsel, 41200 North Echo Canyon Drive. Yes, I saw the flames from that fire in 2004. It was scary. 2005. Five, okay, thank you. <laughs> 2005. I had just moved here. And I ask you zero risk versus one to 100% risk. What would you prefer as far, as far as fire risk? I think I prefer zero risk. Let me read you something, a quote from a publication entitled Independent American Communities. When governments don't represent the interests of the general public, they enact policies that fail to serve the greater good. Put that under your hat and please think of the general public here and not just a business. Thank you. Yolande Grail. I 
I got to speak twice tonight. I'm a Cave Creek resident. My name is Yolan Grill. One year, I invited some friends over from Phoenix to come watch the fireworks from my house. And as we were watching them, a fire broke out in the desert. I don't know if it was the same fireworks display or not, but I could tell you how scared I felt for my house, for my children, and everything around. We have no fire hydrant where we live. It doesn't matter if you have fire coverage or not, people will just stand there and watch our fire and our, our house burn, and it's a very scary proposition. So what the other people said is actually much more eloquent than things I could say, and I love the idea of zero risk versus even 1% risk. And just because we did something for 24 years doesn't mean we have to continue doing it. And I think the 4th of July, tomorrow, by the way, I take my oath to become a US citizen. I'm very emotional about it because I am so excited to be doing this. And this 4th of July is gonna mean something bigger to me. And just the fact that it's not gonna be fireworks because there possibly could be a risk and a permit may not be issued and we're all like just, we don't know, right? But just because that happens, it's not gonna ruin my day. I'm still gonna celebrate July 4th. I'm still gonna feel the pride of having a community be safe. And you know what? So the business needs to challenge themselves to make money in a different way. And if they need help, I'm a very good business owner and I can come up with a million ideas for them to bring people to Cave Creek and have them spend money with or without fireworks. Um, so please don't take away something you've put in place that takes into account that if the fire risk is high, and this is Arizona, that we are gonna be careful. Thank you. Dan Nelson, please state your name and address for the record. I'm Dan Nelson, 11155 East Jimson Local Lane, Scottsdale, Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council members. I appreciate you listening to what I have to say. I've been doing your fireworks up here for 25 years, 25 safe years, okay? Is there risk? Yes, there's risk. There's risk by even driving here tonight. <laughs> is there not? Yes, there is. If you want zero risk, don't get in your car, okay? There is risk involved in everything we do, okay? We have to mitigate those risks, especially in this kind of entertainment arena, which is what we do. In contrast, when I first started doing these shows here, we shot 10 inch diameter shells out of the kite property. 10 inch, it's as big as a basketball. And six inch out of Harold's property. Okay, now we're down to a two and a half inch shell out of Harold's property, which we can mitigate the risk and we can do those safely in that uh, arena that you see there on the board, uh, there's absolutely no reason why we can't conduct a safe and uh, uh, efficient show and keep everything within that fallout area, uh, mitigate the, the risk, we can uh, remove the dry brush. What Mike is saying, there's some credence to that, okay? But we're not out in the, in the wildlands. We're not in the brushy areas. We've taken that away. Okay, so we're doing these fireworks in an area where we have prepared the ground and it's safe to do so, okay? Now, the impact financially to us last year was $20,000 because this show was canceled right at the last minute. I could have sold that show elsewhere for $20,000. I couldn't do it, it was too late. That's an impact to me and my family, okay? So there's absolutely no reason why we can't do this safely and have this entertainment value and benefit the whole community. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for this gentleman. Okay. Can I, can I add something? Because I think I was misportrayed on one thing. Was, <clears throat> yeah. Not only got your time. So did you on many occasions tonight. Thank you. We are not doing this for selfish reasons. I'm proud to be part of the Rodeo Committee and proud to be part of this town. It was a tradition in this town. If we live in fear, then why are we here? You could theoretically say, when a biker gets killed, why have Bike Week? 
If someone gets hurt at rodeo and dies, why are we doing it? You can't do that. I agree with you in incremental uh, mitigation of risks. We've done that. We've gone above and beyond. It's not selfishness. It's part of me being in this town for 30 years and understanding the traditions, respecting the town, respecting the citizens. I have a business here that my family relies on. would never put that in jeopardy. I know the safety factors. We are educated. Uh, With Royal Metro supervising, there is a very limited risk. That's all. And I'm not asking you to disregard any ordinance. I am asking you to change, uh, find an ordinance that takes away the danger of high danger code and create something that everybody can exist with in a safe manner. And that's for you guys to determine. So, do we, do we, yeah. I, 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 I just, I, I've been up here almost 32 years. I can tell you what I see out in front of my house. I have never seen in 32 years. Those camel mills are everywhere. And the amount of work is, is staggering. And I worry about it because everybody around me has a lot of property and they're not going to clear their five acres. It, all it takes is one person on a horse going through my property illegally and throwing a cigarette or someone coming down a hill and throwing out a cigarette. I, I, I can't even begin to tell you. I understand that, but it also begins at home. It begins in each person's home. My responsibility is to everybody who lives in the town. And um, it, it sounds like you, we couldn't even make a decision until the night of if the wind is blowing. I mean, what are the guarantees? There just isn't a guarantee. There just isn't. And I got a question for Rural Metro. If there's a fire, say an hour before, and it's a big fire, and it started someplace else, do you have to leave the scene? Do you have to send a truck? I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm what you're asking. I'm just saying there's a fire someplace else. It's 20 minutes away. It's in a more rural area. Do you guys get a call to go and help put out a big brush fire? We do at times. We have a statewide mutual aid compact. Right. So they can request, but we're not bound to it. So if we're busy, can't afford to send the trucks out, we, we don't. Having said that, though, there are times when we get busy during that time of year. We've had multiple calls on the holiday seasons where the trucks are just bombing around town all night long. Okay. Uh, let, so, I'm going to request that we don't accept any more uh, papers on this one. Go ahead and... Dominique Rout. Um, hello, it's the very first time I come here and um, thank you. Um, you might not understand my uh, accent. Uh, if you don't understand, you just you're fine. Tell me, <laughs> okay? Um, the thing that I don't understand that uh, why you guys don't do something together. It's, I mean, um, I know that it's about business and everything, which I totally understand. Uh, but I mean, if you do something together, like uh, the community of Cave Creek and all all of you guys working here and look at the place that is really safe and have you guys <laughs> doing everything to have everyone safe and have all the money getting together and have all the community uh, paying together to have that event going on, it would be so cool, you know? Um, I know that people want to do by themselves because it's it's on the backyard of whatever um, you know the the place uh, that they do some some money. Uh, but then I I mean it would be so cool if if you you do that together, community and and business and do boom something like Cave Creek, you know like. Wow, you know, all the business are together. You s look for a place, have it safe, cleaned before. Um, 
you guys are here for to do that, to just do it together. I don't know. That's that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Do some money all together. You can do that. I mean, you're all capable to have to do that. And I trust you because I'm here since 10 years. It's the first time I'm coming here, but when I'm talking, when I'm hearing all of you, it's all about business. No, do business together. Just boom, you know, just do it together. It would be so cool. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Bob, Hessel, one more. Just the last one. Sir. Hessel, yes, sir. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. He's the last one, I think. Bob Hessel Gesser, 4741 East Paradise Lane, Phoenix. Spend most of my time in Cave Creek Carefree doing the City Sun Times. And I can tell you one thing for sure. Canceling the fireworks last year cost a ton of business money to the businesses here in Cave Creek. I can tell you that because I call on these businesses continually. But aside from that, the point is this. You talk about danger, fire danger. There's a lot less danger in things happening in a controlled fireworks display than there is with some idiot out in the woods with a campfire don't know how to put them out. I'm from Idaho, Montana. We have four streets, and we're trained from very young age how to put out campfires. I doubt that most people don't even realize how important it is to put out a campfire. So there you go. There's danger in uncontrolled circumstances. So controlled fireworks, not a problem. Have a good evening. Thank you. Is that it? You know, uh, <clears throat> I kind of, I kind of. The reason I wanted this on here is because I, I, I kind of think that there's probably some kind of a, uh, of a place that would actually work. Um, you can mitigate anything and still have bad things happen. And I, and I guess, I guess I just wanted it to be aired out again. Um, but at this point, I want to ask the, the, <clears throat> the wildland expert. <laughs> have you been up there? At Harold's? Yeah. Yes. And looked at that. And looked at that. As far as today or in the past, in, I've attended that past. as I a wild on firefighter there in the past. In yeah, my career. part of the crew helping with with the. Is there any way to mitigate it where two and a half inch shells in in your mind would be would be safe where we don't have an issue? That's that's. Mike, you can answer too. I mean, I, so really quick, there was a couple things that were brought up during the points that were made. Um, one of them was the shells changed size to two and a half inch. That was because we adopted a code and that's the maximum amount that, that can be put there as identified here in this circle. Right. What that doesn't take into effect is any external forces on that, such as wind. Mm -hmm. So that's in a perfect condition. Supposedly if those shells are launched in a vertical manner, they're gonna land inside that circle. To give you an idea, a three inch shell that's unexploded, so one that goes up, it's a dud, and comes back down. Um, it was mentioned 15 mile an hour wind, that's gonna move 147 feet yeah. beyond that. So, you know, we're, what we're talking about here is not in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. They're gonna go back up, they're gonna come back down. I can tell you that last year when I sat there at the fireworks show, I was on the outside of that fallout zone and we had debris falling on the truck. Mm -hmm. fire truck. No, fire trucks aren't allowed there. And so furthermore, as far as rural metro goes, last year we had a challenge. They had a call, they had to leave, their engine left. Um, the engine came back just before the start of it, but we weren't going to allow that fireworks show to go without having them on scene because they were gonna be the contracted people that were there. If they were to get a call and had to leave in the middle of it, the show would end right then. Um, some other just real quick points that were made. Um, last year's show that went off in September, it wasn't outside of our ordinance. We didn't make a special dispensation. 
any public display can be done through permit. It doesn't matter what time of year it is. So just wanted to make sure that we were clear on that piece. And then um, that pretty much would cover all of those pieces. You want to, want to address the fact that they're still calling that a cancellation from July 3rd, please? So a cancellation mm -hmm. from last year or this year? From last year. From last year. So. I wouldn't say that was a cancellation. Matter of fact, what we did is we reached out to Harold's in advance, over a month in advance, and said, we haven't heard from you. And oh, by the way, you might want to have a plan B. Because the way that the uh, um, weather was right then and the amount of moisture we had, we didn't feel that we could safely permit. And to be quite honest, our ordinance didn't allow us to permit any type of this public display of fireworks because we were over and above the uh, the high range on the uh, um, weather rating system, on the fire rating system. Could be that. So, so oh. it wasn't it wasn't canceled. Yeah, sure. it wasn't approved. Oh. Councilman Ray. So is this an either or proposition? So if we do not change the ordinance, Danny can't do a show, or is there some room for negotiation? Mayor, uh, Mayor, members of council. So, so no canceling. But when Danny we, when wants we us began to revise in the, the beginning, I, I mentioned there's there's two issues. There's an ordinance that that was adopted by council in 2017. Prior to that, we had many fireworks in town, but the town had no regulations and no say over the process. Um, who got who could have fireworks that was solely left to rural metro to be on site and whatever rules or regulations or guidelines that rural metro um, had in place at the time to put on the fireworks in the town the town did not have regulations um, in place that our staff had uh, a, a say in the matter, basically. And so once the ordinance was adopted, it allows fireworks in the town core and um, co uh, commercial district, general commercial, and on a public golf course. Those are the only locations you can have a firework. And the regulations are for all of those areas, not just one particular property. And so we established a permitting process and much of the information that we require is also required through a special event permit. Mike went through all of the information that, you know, from insurance and, and all of that, but then went beyond by looking at the national, um, what is the NFPA firework regulations and looking at all the other guidelines because in the town code, the one thing it says in this ordinance is that a fireworks uh, permit may not be, uh, where is it here? I'm losing, I lost my place. But anyway, you can't issue a, per a permit in times of high fire danger or it may be revoked if we had issued a permit. That is up to staff, and those are the guidelines that I think, uh, you know, we're, we're using guidelines from other agencies. We didn't make up our own, and we don't have a way to create new, <laughs> new regulations or new guidelines for just the town of Cave Creek. So those are the things that the staff is using to make that determination. So if we are in times of high fire danger, a permit would not be issued. And last year, the permit was not issued. Now, you have to cut that off at some point. We don't issue a permit right up to the day of the event. It's not fair to the business owner. One, they don't know, and two, they may ha they have to purchase the firework, and it costs money. So we have to tell them yes or no, so that they're not uh, purchasing when uh, we can't issue a permit. And so, as Mike Baxley said, we reached out to them last year to say, we haven't heard from you, we don't have a permit f application on file that we can review and have that discussion with you. And so 
we did that and in the end did not issue a, a permit. And so those, there has to be a cutoff time to be fair to the business owners as well. And you can't predict the wind, I mean, even if we issued a permit, you can't predict the wind to like the minute you're going to, to have the fireworks go off. So there's all kinds of factors that go into this, making a, a decision. So it, it, it's, it's complicated. So there's, there's never 100% guarantee. But it does give the town in this ordinance some teeth and a say in whether or not we do have fireworks. And I think staff has done a good job at gathering the data that is out there and using the criteria from other organizations to make a, a, the, I guess, put through that permit process, make a decision based on the best information we have. And so. that's really what we're looking at. Yeah. 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 Can I? Vice Mayor? I had told uh, Mr. Baxley I wasn't going to say anything tonight, but and and I and I really like to disagree with uh, former uh, Councilwoman Wright, but this is one of those times when it's for, tough for me to do that. Uh, I remember a letter from uh, Chief Grass last year, where he said, "I had concerns in previous years." And I don't think that you disagree with the process that's being used uh, no, by uh, Mr. Baxley at this time. No, I don't. I would be very reluctant to make changes where we sit up here and say, detune this. A little more risk is acceptable. I, I totally disagree about the risk statement that was made. Everybody has risk. Yes, but they're risks that should be acceptable, not risks that are brought beyond what is considered to be acceptable. So I would be incredibly reluctant to do anything to change the ordinance. That's just my statement. Councilman D. Um, the other day I posted a picture on Facebook of a chain hook that had been uh, obviously drug along Fleming Springs Road, huh. quite scarred up and uh, hadn't started any fires. Um, there's a risk of dragging a chain down Fleming Springs Road, starting quite a few fires. I think you could drag a chain down uh, Cave Creek Road through the middle of town and not start any fires. To me, it looks like, yeah, there's risk in everything. Um, I'm building a house right now that uh, has concerned many of my neighbors because I do a lot of welding and grinding. I know how to mitigate those risks. I have a hose there ready to go. I've welded a lot in the desert, and I've never started anything on fire. It seems like, just to give an extreme example, if there was no grass or any vegetation for you know, a quarter mile around this circle, it didn't matter what the fire danger was, chances of starting a fire are fairly slim. It seems like that the fire danger is great. This would be bad to have people setting off fireworks in neighborhoods where there are no roads, there are no breaks, and there's not a lot of dirt. It seems like that, uh, and I was trying to look at the definitions of what's a high fire risk, what's low. It seems like Arizona's pretty much high fire risk almost all the time these days. I think maybe one possible solution may be to just bump that up for the town core, whatever the next layer is. I don't know if that would still have solved this problem or not, whether that would. But it just seems like there's minimal risk doing this in the town core. The town core is not out in a wild desert. It is, there are fire breaks. Um, and it just seems like we're smart enough to come up with a solution, not tailored to Danny specifically, but looking at the real reality of the town core which is more pavement than not, as opposed to the rural areas, which are very little pavement. I understand that. And it just seems like we can come up with a solution to potentially allow this. And I know that there are no guarantees. If the wind pops up, yeah, you can, the, the cancel the fire truck leaves, yeah. I don't think anybody's arguing that the show must go on no matter what. But I think we've, um, 
gone a little too much restrictive on this in the town core. Councilman McGuire. Yeah, there, there are two points that I want to make. Much as I love you, Mr. Diefendorfer, in the town core, we do have a lot of plants. If you look on these diagrams to the southwest, there is a lot of vegetation there, but that's in the town core. The other point that I wanted to make is somebody said, I can get in my car, I can drive home, I might kill myself, Danny might come out and kill me, who knows? But it's just me who dies, it's not my neighbors. And I think this risk isn't just for one person, it's for the community. Councilman Morris. Well, those who know my history know that uh, I did this, not fire, but uh, putting people in danger was my business, myself too. And uh, I had very high standards. Economics were never one of them. I don't think uh, there's any economic justification um, given the possible scope of what might happen. Um, Councilman McGuire said it perfectly. We're not, it's not just me at risk, it's uh, we're putting others at risk. It's not just uh, the people that are there, it's not just uh, one individual, it's people who may be over the hill and know nothing's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I was inclined, I think, before this to, to, to do this because we always had a saying, uh, with enough time and enough money, you can do anything safely. Um, but we're, we're making this decision for all time and for all situations, like the town manager just said. Um, at, at the same time, Harold's is, is the <laughs> senior uh, attraction in town, been here forever, and uh, Danny is such an incredible um, town asset has always been, is now, the rodeo, everything. Um, so this is, this is really hard for me, but I'm, I'm gonna have to go on the side that, uh, that we've got to protect the public interest and we, there will be a fire. There will be a fire, maybe not this year, maybe next year, but it's gonna happen and we're challenging our safety systems. You don't purposely challenge, start a fire just to see if you can put it out. And um, so it's a little different from other situations that are there. So I'm, uh, I'm inclined to leave the ordinance the way it is. My only comment would be again, I, I hope that if we keep the ordinance in place that it doesn't absolutely prohibit Danny from moving forward. If conditions are appropriate, then perhaps we can move forward if he's still inclined to work with the town, given, given the restrictions within the ordinance. Okay. I can see from the comments uh, that there's no sense moving forward any, any further, further forward with this. And uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, appreciate your hanging out with us. Um, it's not going to uh, get belabor it. Yeah, yeah. No, no sense in beating on it now. I mean, I've got uh, four, so four solid no's for sure. So I think we'll move on to agenda item number four, which is moving backwards again. Uh, council discussion and consideration to approve resolution number R2019 05, authorizing amendment one to the intergovernmental agreement IGA with Maricopa County for law enforcement services. Uh, Town Marshal. Sorry about making you stay up so late. The direction to staff basically is to maintain what we're doing. Yeah, I think, yeah, Thank there's you. no, no direction whatsoever. Okay. Without a table, without a motion, without anything, just discussion. You, you can do every way. You, you, you don't have to vote if you don't wish. I mean, yeah. you yeah. No, not voting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council. Um, what you have tonight before you is resolution, uh, Part 2019-05, authorizing amendment one. Uh, 
it's the contract for the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, which is law enforcement services provided to the town. Um, they're asking to amend a contract, which we had signed uh, July 1st, 2018. It's a three-year contract that would end uh, 30 June 2021. Um, I've highlighted the um, amendments. Uh, part of the one of the amendments is that they're wishing to uh, include law enforcement services for spur cross conservation area uh, with this amendment. Previously, uh, the town's law enforcement for spur cross uh, conservation area was in the spur cross contract. So now they've moved it over to the uh, sheriff's office contract. Um, <clears throat> they've amended uh, worksheet exhibit A uh, in the second year. Uh, and it included staffing requirements um, with the consent decree that's occurred with the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office due to some lawsuits. Um, supervision was an issue. Um, so what they've done is they've said that one sergeant typically used to be able to supervise nine deputies. Now, unfortunately, that one sergeant can only super supervise eight deputies. Um, so that was a change in there. Um, contract. Ammunition, uh, previously the way the sheriff's office were to calculate how much ammunition costs were, were to um, go off of the previous uh, year's actual cost. Now it's based on uh, four years uh, previous and they average it. Um, they're now charging us for iPhone usage. Um, again, as part of the consent decree with the uh, recent litigation with the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, um, They've had to increase their technology tremendously to include, include um, iPhones, cell phones, and body cameras. So they're passing that cost on to us as well. And then, of course, there's an indirect cost recovery. Um, it's been revised and replaced to include a 3% administrative service charge. Um, previous contract was 496,562 uh, and change. Um, they've increased it to $761,756 and change, uh, which is approximately a $265,000 increase over the previous contract. Um, I would recommend that we uh, accept these amendments. Would, would they be insulted if we put a caveat in here that uh, if they don't don't requalify with their pistol after two tries that they actually get sent somewhere else where they have to pay for ammo. You know, it only because you brought it up. Um, their, their qualifications uh, requirements are actually very stringent. They'll take away that deputy's gun if he fails his qualification, um, and then he'll have an opportunity to pass, and then he's re-educated, and then if he doesn't pass, he's... Not working here no more. Cool. So we won't have to we won't have to uh, pay for flyers. <laughs> <laughs> questions from council? I Last, have one. Uh, can, the impression I get, and it's a question in a way, uh, is this because we've got a new sheriff in town? Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Penn. That that somebody is looking at the history and the the actual uh, time and effort mm -hmm. and all of that kind of stuff. Or is this something that is purely a bean counter type action? I could tell you that in my 17 years as the Marshal of Cave Creek, um, the contract has very, very slowly had minimal increases. This is really the first significant, in my opinion, increase um, in my 17 years here. With this, with this lawsuit that the sheriff's office went through, um, there were significant changes to the way they did business. And they realized that those changes cost money. Well, they have to pass that cost down to the end user, and we are the end user. So uh, I understand. Um, like I said, it's been 17 years without a major, in, I've only been here 17 years without a major increase. Um, I, I think, yes, new management is certainly paying attention to everything. But so it's, it's kind of a degree of uh, some new uh, responsibilities coming down, new ways of doing business, and a little bit of catch-up. I think there's a lot of catch-up that's occurring. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no kidding. Well, they also increased our uh, our coverage if, as far as uh, the shift that we were at poor, what, 0 0.41 for a lot of years or something. Or That's not what this uh, resolution, this resolution is just the changes that they have uh, brought out. But yes, uh, we will be moving from a 0 0.41 to a 0 0.61, yeah. which is actually a, a blessing in my opinion. Um, it's an incremental increase. Uh, what they were looking for was a, uh, a full 1.1 uh, beat. 
So having this step certainly minimizes our liability. Right, right. All right. Other questions? Mr. Mayor, uh, if I, I would suggest that uh, if you do decide to approve this, you add it with a contingency authorizing its execution provided they add a, a sentence that preserves a workers' comp, workers comp immunity that's included in every joint agreement between two agencies across the state. We had suggested it. I think they left it out as an oversight. It's entirely in their interest and your interest to preserve that immunity. I'm convinced they'll allow it. Uh, if you were to authorize this execution provided they add that sentence, we'll communicate that desire. All right. Mr. Mayor? Who said that? Karen. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Mayor? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm looking all over. My eyes have got the, 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 the pollen has got me. My eyes are trying to close on me. As, a, as the town marshal yeah. said, th this, this is, the purpose of this really is to get the amendments approved. But, right. but a couple reasons I wanted to make sure that this came before you now, before we get into the budget, is that what is required in the IGA is that the county has to come forward with a budget every year by a certain time period. And they've proposed this. This actually, this whole issue with the, the .41 beat going to .61 came up a whole year ago, right. right in the middle of our budget process, but it was after the deadline for them to submit. So they've submitted on time, with information instead of 0.91, they're at a 0.61. So I think they heard our voices last year going, Are you kidding? this, this <laughs> 0.41 was in place right. before I got here 21 years ago. Yeah, well, we so it's been a long time. People. It's gone up simply by the salary increases, and, and we purchased, we paid for like a car here or there as they added some staff. But that's that increment, that salary increase and things like that is all we were paying extra for. We never had a, a, a percentage beat increase. Yeah. And they intend to increase it again in the future. So I wanted you to see this, and then part two was the fact that they've included the deputy from Spur Cross Ranch Conservation Area. There's a whole history of that, of how there used to be park police. We used to pay for three, yeah. went down to one, all of that. And you see that now because next council meeting, you're going to hear from RJ, RJ and yeah. the park budget, and I, I wanted you to see this ahead of time before we get in, into that. So that's all part of the contract in place, and right. so we can move forward with public comment. Uh, Councilman McGuire. What's our alternative? <laughs> <laughs> you're looking yeah. at it. <laughs> Good heavens, no. Well, it would cost it, far. Have to we'll have to buy Adam a bunch of no-dos. <laughs> it would fo co cost far more to have your own police department, and you wouldn't be able to have the services that we get along with this contract. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Any other questions? Okay, there's public comment on this. We have none? Okay, back to council. To for a motion. For a motion. Why mm -hmm. don't you do it? Sure. Whoever can read okay. that. Okay. Well, but you're going to add the caveat. Motion to approve resolution number 2019-05, authorizing amendment number one to the IGA, IGA with Maricopa County for law enforcement services to include the verbiage proposed by uh, attorney Sims uh, relative to workers' compensation. Second. Comment? This no comment. is something we got to do. Yeah, I mean, this is a lot of money. We better do a we better do a roll call on this one. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Council Member McGuire. Sorry, Adam. We just can't do this to you. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Mayor Smith. Yes. Council Member Diefenderfer? Yes. Council Member Clancy? Yes. Council Member mm -hmm. Royer? Yes. Council Member Morris? Yes. Mayor Bunch? Yes, by 7 0 motion carries. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number five. Finally, Robert gets to come up and tell us about how we're doing. Presentation, council discussion, the quarterly financial report by the town finance director. Sorry about leaving you last, Robert. I just looked down and realized I'd done that to you. Good job. No problem. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, basically, uh, 
can sum this up as uh, since the last time I've reported, we had uh, collected more revenue and spent more money. So. <laughs> As long as the more revenue is greater than the spending, we're good. yes, actually it is. Even though, <laughs> even though the uh, the budget had indicated that this year would be a year where our expenditures would actually be in excess of our revenues, um, the inverse is true at this point in time. Um, so basically, we're going to go through March. Uh, this this data includes uh, information through the end of March of 2019 compared to the end of March of 2018. And it also includes uh, the budget column, so you can see how we compare. This is a very high-level overview. So basically, it combines uh, all the governmental funds in the first half, and the second half is just the enterprise operation. And uh, the governmental and all other funds is about 11 funds. So each of those, um, of that, about four-fifths of the total totals that we're about to see is general fund, and a fifth is all other funds, uh, governmental funds. And then in the second half, again, we'll, we'll go through the enterprise operations. The enterprise is broken down into a little more detail since we had segregated at the uh, beginning of this year uh, the enterprise fund from one fund into three separate funds, one for wastewater, one for desert, uh, sorry, uh, desert hills, and one for Cave Creek. So um, that's not the order I meant to say that in, but. Um, so overall, uh, in, on the governmental side, you can see that the total revenues are at 84% of budget uh, at 75% of the completion of the year. Um, and it does compare favorably to last year in, uh, in that we've collected more revenue um, for the first nine months of 2019 than the first nine months of 2018. Uh, again, the expenditures are a little bit higher um, compared, but again, we're well under budget in total, and that has to do with some appropriation authority that was given to us through grants and contingency that we don't have a grant for or plan to use contingency funds for uh, anything at this point. So um, total expenditures, uh, also uh, it is higher because it was uh, a few million higher than uh, the previous year, so we expected the expenditures to be higher during uh, this year than last year. Um, these are the revenues broken down into major categories, um, and you can see uh, that we have collected far more in taxes um, relative to the percentage year that's expired at 75%, we're at 94% of tax revenue, which is principally uh, sales tax. Um, uh, state shared revenue is a little bit behind, but uh, we probably have um, some unrecorded uh, quarter, qu um, monthly payments uh, that we uh, haven't, haven't collected yet. So this is on the cash basis. Um, let's see, charges for services, um, that includes uh, engineering uh, services and um, that is ahead of schedule and that has to do with uh, construction a lot to do with construction as well as the tax revenue. It's just a lot higher than uh, we had predicted, which is, uh, which is nice. Um, and then, uh, so that's the revenue is very, looking very good. Uh, on the expenditure side, again, this is just general public functions, general government, which is basically administration, public, safe, public safety, which is the magistrate court and the law enforcement, highways and streets, which is uh, public works and engineering, culture and recreation, which is special events and uh, parks and trails and uh, those types of things. And then a capital outlay, which is uh, overall general capital outlay category. Um, so we are at about 43% overall on the governmental side for expenditures. Um, and if you look at the major categories, um, you know, we are under 75% in the top five uh, items there. Um, so there doesn't, there isn't a problem with us exceeding our budget authority at this point. And again, um, I just wanted to let you know, and probably haven't, I didn't say in the beginning of the presentation, but so our legal level of control in the general fund is by department. So as long as the department is under expenditures, we haven't violated the appropriation authority that was granted us uh, through the adoption of the budget for FY19. Um, and so it doesn't look like we will either. Um, so this is the preliminary results of the enterprise operations. Um, this is everything combined. So you can see that we're at about 66% of user fees. And again, you know, the sales tax dedicated to the sewer operation is higher than expected. 
which is a good thing, but the uh, user fees are less than what was projected because we did include at least some period of time to be uh, affected by a possible rate adjustment. So um, that's a little bit less than what it, it, it would have been had any type of rate uh, um, presentation been made and accepted. Um, expenditures, uh, it looks like we're doing pretty well on that side. Um, we're a little high on materials and supplies and um, services, um, and that's because of the filter replacement and the fact that we went without a uh, utilities director for quite a while, but um, we're utilizing a um, contract utility director. Um, so uh, s salaries and wages you'll see are under, and then um, uh, services are over because of that. And so this is just the wastewater side. And again, the revenues are slightly down on the user fees. Um, again, uh, from what was projected because they were increased with potential rate adjustment. Uh, salaries uh, and wages are a little bit uh, higher on the sewer side, but there are significant savings in the uh, re remaining categories of services, materials, and supplies, and capital to, um, to offset the, the overage at this point. I, I, oh, I'm playing, I, I don't think they'll go over as a department at this point. Um, that, this one is probably one that I'll watch closer. Um, Cape Creek water system, again, a little bit low on the revenue side. Um, overall, uh, expenditures because of uh, materials and supplies being a little bit higher, you can still see though that there's savings in capital and, uh, and salaries. And uh, the service is a little bit higher than 75% because, again, the uh, um, utility director was being paid through contract rather than through salaries for the most part. And then um, this is Desert Hills water. And uh, again, revenues are down slightly. Um, projections included uh, rate adjustment potentially. Um, salaries and wages are uh, under actually. Um, materials and supplies, services, they're all a little bit under. Um, uh, there was uh, some mid-year classification changes or allocation changes and, and some personnel changes that were made um, that uh, did impact uh, Desert Hills favorably um, for uh, FY19. So, and then on the next slide, I just wanted to point out our debt service payment schedule um, and amounts for July 1. Uh, that is, uh, utility side is about $4.2 million. It still needs to be recorded. It still needs to be paid. Um, that's, uh, we do one annual principal payment per year. It's not uh, broken up into, you know, several amounts. It's just once a year. So that's, that's a lot of uh, the cost of debt service is, is loaded at the back end of the year. And then uh, cash balances, uh, as of March 31st, you can see we have approximately, uh, at that point, 21 million, which is about 21.56 million right now. Um, the reserves are an estimated amount that's uh, for one year's annual debt service, which is the principal and interest, uh, which is the same each year, um, but also um, it includes a repair and replacement reserve that's an estimated amount because we're allowed to offset um, basically repair and replacement costs against that reserve balance. So that's the estimated amount. So when we look at what's left for the town, it's about $14 million. So that's uh, that's uh, better than last time and it continues to improve. Yes, I'm sorry. So if, if we have to replace a, a line that's in service now, can we take it out of that $6,975? Well, uh, this is basically showing that we have the capacity to pay for it. Where we get the authority to pay for it is through the budget. And in the budget, based on our capital outlay budget, uh, if it was a major capital item, um, it, it appears that we are also under budget in that category. But so, can, can, can we spend that money on, on things? The I, six, nine, six well, nine? Yes, as long as it's included in our expenditure authority and under it, then we would be able to. We would have the capacity to spend the money because um, we have the money. So, so we have twenty-one million dollars. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, were there any questions? Uh, Councilman McGuire? Yeah, at one time we were up to, I think, 60 or $62 million in debt for, well, mainly for the water systems. Uh, what's that current uh, amount now? I, I believe it's $47 uh, million. Thank you for the question, uh, Councilmember McGuire. Thank you. Yeah. No more questions? Thank you, Mr. Wedigan. All right, thank you, and have a good evening. Oh, there is there a public comment on that? No.
Oh, yes, there um, Yes, there was. Do we have any? No forms. Uh, I believe that concludes all of the items on our agenda this evening, finally. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nobody, everybody wants to go home. I figured that. Yeah, I have